Colleague to order the Spokane City Council meeting for this evening, August 1st. Uh, if you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council President Beggs? Here. Council Member Bingle? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Council Member Sapone? Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, and after a long drought, we have two uh, poets at the podium this evening. I'm super excited. It's a joint program we have with um, Spokane Arts. And first up is going to be Mark Anderson, and after that, Sarah Rooney. Thank you for once again welcoming poets back into this space. Um, and I know Spokane Arts is very excited to uh, have poets reading from Chris Cook's, uh, the current Spokane Poet Laureate, Chris Cook's In the Neighborhood pro Project over the coming months. This poem um, that I'm reading is called Innocence. Innocence left us like a firefly escaping a glass jar. It went to live in a coastal hamlet with pastel crayon roofs that slope yellow and blue, where perhaps people are not cruel as children's laughter. Fine, we said when it left, but even with all the electric light bulbs in the world, we have trouble seeing the good in each other. I imagine innocence took work as a confectioner. It rises early to bake lush strawberry fields into gumdrop cakes. When adults complain its flavors lack complexity, it does not resort to bitterness. Every night, it screams into the ocean it wants us to believe in the importance of the seagull diving beneath the wave, in the small magical life in the sand. But instead, we clench our hearts, knowing any moment our scars could come unzipped. What then? The world's gone mad. I hate to say it, but I fear it's nothing new. We write letters to innocence and cork them in bottles, hoping the tide delivers to the correct address. We promise a homecoming parade, floats and marching bands, balloons that soar so high they never have to come back down. We promise this time we'll do better. When a butterfly settles into our palm, we will not pin it to the wall. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Sarah Rooney. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity to, you know, allow for uh, dialogues in the arts, and uh, I'm just so happy to be here. My poem is called Backyard. Outside the window is a forest parked in a neighborhood on a hill perfect for exploring the contained wilderness and of Sherbert sunsets. Canopies of pine trees and tracks by mud-encrusted boots searching for a moment outside of the boxed indoors, treading on deep-sown roots. Tangles who've bonded with the earth below for generations and grown up reaching to the sky. The wind whispers of hand holding by the pond within the dark, sparkling stars providing illumination. During the day, climbers stare at the precipice preparing themselves for what's to come. The moss-covered stones remain resilient in the heavy snow, and there's a lush verdantness in the trees and flora despite the frost. As the sun passes through the sky and days warm, the mornings become a display of golden highlights caressing trees as they lean, bent from listening to the wind. The warmth brings more vibrancy to the brilliance of colors blooming from the ground. People walk their dogs, following different pathways, searching to breathe deep the calm air and rest their mind from the plastic and metallic that usually surrounds them. There are pockets of silent revelry that allow the soul to rest easy inside of the chest, giving a respite from the harsh beating inside, slowing down and finding a new rhythm. 
As the earth heals itself, the energy it provides heals its guests, those souls who curiously meander through the trees and bushes surrounding the park. Here, there is a place for recovery and hope, when the snow frosts the earth or when the new growth reaches out to the sun. The laughter from children on the playground below echoes out like leaves on branches happily rustling in a soothing breeze. No matter how often the area is explored, new life and voices join in on the symphony of sound in the surroundings. The rhythm leaves a soft humming in the body that clears cobwebs of dust covering the trails within. Each clearing reveals to its visitors the crisp air that encompasses all and is crucial to survival. And this is about my backyard, which is Lincoln Park. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sarah. It was great. To both of you. So glad to have you all back. Uh, we have uh, one proclamation for National Health Center Week. And Council Member Zappone is going to read that. And Mike Weiser is going to accept it. Mike, you can come on up to the podium. Um, Whereas for over 55 years, community health centers have provided high quality, affordable, comprehensive primary and preventative health care in underserved communities, having a significant impact on America's health care system. And whereas, as the country's largest primary care network, CHCs are the health care for home for over 30 million Americans in over 14,000 communities across the nation, serving one in 12 people in the United States. And whereas CHCs serve as beacons of essential resources and support in testing and treatment in the face of the global coronavirus pandemic, and we can, will continue to offer reliable, affordable, high quality care against COVID-19 for America's most vulnerable and underserved communities. And whereas every day, CHCs develop new approaches to integrating a wide range of services beyond primary care, including oral and health, oral health, vision, behavioral health, and pharmacy services to meet the needs and challenges of their communities. And whereas CHCs are governed by patient majority boards, ensuring that patients are incurred, engaged in their healthcare decisions, and whereas CHCs are locally owned and operated businesses that serve as critical economic engines, helping to power local economies by generating $63.4 billion in economic activity in some of the country's most economically deprived communities, and whereas CHCs employ more than 253,000 people nationwide, including physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and certified nurse midwives who work as part of a multidisciplinary clinical team designed to treat the whole patient, and whereas the CHC model continues to prove an efficient means of overcoming barriers to healthcare access, including geography income and insurance status, improving healthcare outcomes, and reducing healthcare system costs, and whereas CHCs are on the front lines, front lines of emerging healthcare crisis, providing access to care for our nation's veterans, addressing the opioid epidemic, and responding to public health threats in the wake of natural disasters. And whereas National Health Center Week celebrate America's CHC sites, their dedicated staff, board members, patients, and all those responsible for their continued success and growth since the first health care centers opened their doors more than 55 years ago. And whereas during the National Health Center Week, we celebrate the legacy of America's CHCs and their vital role in shaping the past, present, and future of America's health care system. Now, therefore, Brian Beggs, Spokane City Council President, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, hereby proclaim August 7th through 13th, 2022, as National Health Care Health Center Week. That was a long one. Thanks. All right. <laughs> All right. Great. Mike, tell us more. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Council President Beggs and Council Members of Bone. Uh, we had some help with our national organization writing that. That's why it was so long, but appreciate spending the time to do that because it really reinforces the idea that healthcare um, access is so critical to the vitality of our whole city. Uh, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer with Chaz Health. We're one of three community health centers with clinics um, in Spokane. There's about a dozen in total, along with uh, Native Project mm -hmm. and Unify Health. And we wouldn't uh, have the wide variety of access to services that we have without partnership with the city and collaboration. Um, about a year and a half ago, we opened up a, a dental clinic in the East Central neighborhood with uh, Sp City of Spokane support. And we've collaborated on um, other opportunities with the city uh, that helped with uh, the Rogers School-based health center as well. And we're seeing an increased demand for health services uh, nowadays and another um, infectious disease uh, challenge uh, coming to us right now. So we look forward to future collaborations to continue to meet that uh, need for access to health care. So thanks again. All right. Thank you. Uh, next, we have four appointments to the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board, except one of them, I think, if Jordan Kahn's on the list, let's delay Jordan until uh, the 15th because we haven't 
done the interview for Jordan yet. So if you could read the other ones. Okay. Appointments of the following to the CTAB, Lindsay Shaw, District 1, Position 1 for a term ending August 1, 2025. Barbara Coe, District 2, Position 2 for a term ending August 1, 2024, and Stefan Rodriguez, District 3, Position 2 for a term ending August 1, 2025. All right. All those in favor of appointment, indicate by saying aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right. They're appointed. Thank you in advance for your service. And again, if anyone uh, wants to serve on uh, various boards and commissions at the city, uh, most of them are appointed by the mayor, and there's an application process and a web page that has all the boards and commissions, what they do, what openings are out there, what terms are coming up, and uh, love to have you participate. There's a few that are council-driven, uh, which this one was, um, but also it's on the boards and commissions web page, so thanks for that. Um, we're just about to do the consent agenda, and we're going to start public testimony, and I just want to remind people, because I see some people I haven't seen before, is that we, uh, even though we clapped in the beginning of the meeting, now that we're in the legislative session, we don't do clapping or cheering or booing or hissing or anything that would um, uh, distract or get in the way of having a safe space. We ask for no vulgarities and no personal insults. Uh, I don't see any signs, but we don't allow sign waving. If you have a t-shirt or a button or a hat, that's okay. Um, you get up to three minutes to testify. Uh, this has a yellow light that goes on with one minute left and then red when the time is up, and I'll ask you to stop. Um, I think that covers it, so thanks. Let's read the consent agenda, and then we have one person, uh, Sabrina Meltzer, who's going to testify. And Sabrina, you can kind of wake your, make your way up here. It'll take a few minutes to read the consent agenda. But go ahead, Madam Clerk. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, contract amendment with Spokane Testing Solutions. Spokane adding hearing examinations to provided services from March 1, 2022 to February 28, 2027. Additional costs not to exceed $30,000 annually. Number two, low bid of inland infrastructure. Spokane for Monroe Grind and Overlay Project, $1,549,604. An administrative reserve of $154,960.40, which is 10% of the contract price, will be set aside. Riverside and West Central Neighborhoods. Number three, local area A&D professional services consultant agreement with Parametrics Incorporated Spokane to design and potentially be the construction administration for the Garland Avenue Pathway Project. $92,980 grant funded, Hilliard Neighborhood. Number four, recommendation to list the Otto and Catherine Hansen House, 1220 West 11th Avenue on the Spokane Register of Historic Places. Number five, Community Housing and Human Services Affordable Housing Com Committee recommendation for the housing and housing related supportive services notice of funding availability results. Number six, report of the mayor of pending A claims and payments of previously approved obligations including those of Parks Library through July 22, 2022. Total five million two hundred fifty three thousand one hundred fifty five dollars seventeen cents with Parks and Library claims approved by their respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library total $4,620,949.50. B, payroll claims of previously approved obligations through July 23, 2022, $8,018,847.70. Number seven, City Council meeting minutes for July 18 and July 28, 2022. Number eight, contract amendment and extension with governmentjobs.com doing business as NeoGov, El Segunda, California, adding the NeoGov learning system which will replace the Skillsoft system an extending contract until February 11, 2027. Total cost $637,407.76 plus applicable taxes. Relates to special budget ordinance C36250, which will be considered later this evening. Number nine, purchase of fleet services and an additional 46 Ford K8 electric hybrid models when the 2022 ordering window opens. $3,128,000 relates to special budget ordinance C36249, which will be considered during the 6 p.m. legislature. Er, Considered later this evening, sorry. And number 10, corrected agreement amendment D with Catholic Charities to increase fund from the emergency solutions grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development for the House of Charity Emergency Shelter, $170,272. Total contract amount, $1,784,978. All right. Thank you, and welcome. You have up to three minutes. Hi, so my name's Sabrina. Um, I'm very new to Spokane. I came here about two years ago from New York, and I just want to thank you guys for the time for letting me speak. Um, 
This has been my first time I came to the last one and I wasn't able to speak because I didn't know it was going to be a whole big thing. So just trying to kind of get a little experience in speaking and getting to those public resources that are there and knowing that we can speak with them. I did mean to sign up for the ordinance um, C36234, so I don't know why I accidentally got on the consent agenda, but right. I have what? nothing to say about the consent agenda. So uh, okay. yeah, sorry about that. I just didn't want to waste you guys' time, Thanks. but I do appreciate it. Um, what, what's the topic of? Um, the public safety and judicial grant fund. So I believe that it just oh, wasn't listed on the Google form doc, so. Yes, because okay. we deferred it. Oh, you deferred it. Okay, that is my apologies um, then. Well, <laughs> we just did it at 3.30 today, but we okay. deferred it until August 22nd. August 22nd. Okay, yep. awesome. And is there any reason for that or like what? Yeah, we're in that just sense discussing. Why you guys deferred? Yeah, we're just trying to get more research on um, some of the other costs that could come out of that account. Okay, so, that was totally yeah. where I was coming yeah. from with it yeah. too. So, okay, okay. awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys for the time. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. All right. That brings us to special budget ordinance. Oh, no, sorry. We got to vote. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right, consent agenda is approved. That brings us to special budget ordinances. Ordinances amending ordinance number C36161 passed by the City Council of December 13, 2021 and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency and appropriating funds in. Ordinance C36246, American Rescue Plan Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $27,870,000 funded from the city's direct allocation of the state and local fiscal recovery fund of the American Rescue Plan Act. A, of the increased appropriation, $1,500,000 is provided for the purpose of funding capital expenditures on city-owned property leased to community centers as follows. $500,000 to the Northeast Community Center towards renovation of the former Northeast Library Branch. $500,000 to the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center at East Central towards renovation of the HVAC system and $500,000 to the West Central Community Center towards mutually agreed upon capital improvements. B, of the increased appropriation, $2,400,000 is provided for the purpose of funding the ad to pay for the collective bargaining agreements. C, of the increased appropriation, $5 million is provided for the purpose of funding higher education success for local high school students. D, of the increased appropriation, $5 million is provided for the grants to not-for-profit entities in order to recover from the impact created by the COVID pandemic. E, of the increased appropriation, $5 million is provided for the grants to small business entities in order to recover from the impact created by the COVID pandemic. F, of the increased appropriation, $5 million is provided for the capital cost of a municipal justice center. G, of the increased appropriation, $2,500,000 is provided to neighborhood business district support. H, of the increased appropriation, $1 million is provided for support for multicultural centers. I of the increased appropriation, $350,000 is provided for additional administrative support related to distributing ARPA funds. J of the increased appropriation, $120,000 toward providing shelter during extreme weather events, including but not limited to extra staffing hours at libraries during extended cooler se cooling center hours and operation of standalone cooling centers. This action arises from the need to provide appropriation authority for funding supporting small business and not-for-profit organizations, future education in a COVID-19 safe community. All right, and we actually don't have anyone signed up to testify on this, um, but this is tranche, we're calling it tranche three of allocations. This sets aside money in various buckets as uh, listed by the clerk. And then there'll be a process where the administration and council will work out what the specific rules and guidelines for each of the spending in, in those areas. So that's coming up. Any council commentary? <clears throat> yeah, I think most of the things on this on this list are, are, are good. I appreciate that we're investing in the community. There's a couple things on here that I wish were on here that aren't and some things that are on here that I wish, uh, you know, weren't. Uh, Councilman Cathcart submitted some um, an amendment today that I supported, um, and it would have moved the um, the funding for police vehicles, which we're going to uh, talk about in a little bit, into ARPA. Um, and the reason why why I think that's really important is because uh, you know there's some financial challenges that the city is facing right now, and ARPA dollars were partially intended to help make the city whole. And I don't know that we are um, doing that at the level that we should be. Um, 
I appreciate you know the difficulty that there is in spending $81 million, and I appreciate what the ARPA committee is, is doing. Um, I just would have done it slightly differently. Um, the last thing uh, that's on there is the Municipal Justice Center um, that we're going to be uh, you know, allocating dollars for in this. Um, I find to be sort of inconsistent with what we're asking for citing essential facilities. And I know that uh, it's not defined as an essential city facility based on uh, the language that we have, but I think that that's just uh, more definitional rather than uh, in practice. And so uh, there's a couple of things on here that, that I wouldn't have had and some things that I would have, I do intend to vote for it because uh, most of this I think is pretty good, so. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, yeah, let me start by saying I, I do plan to vote for this, and uh, I did offer a couple of amendments this afternoon that, uh, one, I, I uh, withdrew because I got some assurances that we would address it um, in the RFP, which is simply identifying that the uh, nonprofits that we would be funding will be uh, service-oriented and, and not so much advocacy-oriented, and that was a concern that I had, and so I got some assurances there, uh, and then in addition, I had added a couple of items that I just feel is really important for us to consider um, additional funding for the Northeast Community Center, uh, additional funding for the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center. They have some pretty big <coughs> HVAC issues and in the current heat and uh, issues in the weather, kind of an important one. But as we discussed earlier, even if we funded it uh, completely today, you know, there's just no way they could actually get that fixed, you know, overnight. So regardless of when we fund it, it is going to be a, uh, it's going to take some time to get that fixed, but it is something that we have to make a, make a priority. Um, I also included the police cars because taking that out of un, um, appropriated reserves is, you know, a, a difficult decision to make. We obviously have a l very limited time frame uh, for these vehicles, and we'll be talking about that coming up. Uh, but it's a, a, a very tricky situation that we're in um, on that one. So, um, I, but I do want to say, I mean, a lot of the stuff here is really important. We're going to be, you know, supporting a lot of people in our community uh, in, in different ways. And one that I'm really excited about, and I just wanted to touch on, is, you know, this higher education piece. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that we've had an opportunity to do with ARPA dollars, and I think this could be it, is trying to identify that thing that is sort of that medium to long-term investment that is that we're going to be able to look back in 10, 20, 30 years and say, you know, wow, we, we did something really good with those dollars that we had. And, and it's something that's going to be long lasting and have a very long term positive impact on our community. And I really think that there's a potential for these uh, higher education dollars to fit that need. You know, the county has contributed towards this. Uh, the school districts uh, uh, and other uh, nonprofit entities are <clears throat> contributing towards this. And the end goal is that once this is fully in place, uh, kids in our community across the region are going to have access to higher education, be it trade schools, uh, community colleges, four-year universities. They would have access that they did not have previously. And to be able to be an education-first community, I think, puts us on an amazingly competitive ground. And it's something that I think we will look back on as a really important decision that we made. So I'm, I'm really grateful to have this in front of us. Again, I think there's some, some modifications to this list that if I had my druthers, I certainly would uh, consider. Um, but as it is, I will support it. And there are some really important investments in here. So I will leave it at that. <clears throat> Councilmember Wilkerson. Well, thank you. Now I got that frog out of my throat. I'm ready to talk. <clears throat> I will be supporting this. There are, all of these are critical to our community. I echo Councilmember Catcart's comment about the higher education. It is the first regional thing that we have taken on as a community to go upstream to address some systemic problems um, in our community. The other two that's really important to me is the allocations for small businesses and nonprofits. They took the big brunt of COVID they stepped into a gap that they were not prepared for, and they rose to the challenge. So being able to replenish some of their resources and sustain them to go forward to meet whatever the next challenge is in our community is critical. You know, small businesses couldn't get rental assistance. And we talk a lot about that for homeowners and renters, but small businesses did not have that ability. And so they are really struggling to keep their doors open. And I want to applaud the small businesses because when everything was shut down, our small businesses stayed open. 
thank God, because I would have gone hungry. But, you know, we really have to appreciate the people who live here, grow up here, work here. We like the big box, but the mom and pop down the street is really the spice that makes Spokane Spokane. So, again, I'll be supporting this. Councilmember Sapone. Yeah, I'm, ex I'm really excited to be supporting this. I know it's been a, a long process of uh, getting a lot of input, and there's a lot of needs in our community. And so I think this package, it shows an investment in our community. It shows uh, that council is prioritizing economic development in our community when it comes to our workforce and developing our workforce and that commitment to higher education and the wraparound services that are tied to that. I think that it also shows that commitment to nonprofits and small businesses that were impacted greatly by COVID and that we are uh, wanting to invest in them and grow. I'm also particularly excited about the neighborhood business district support. We have a lot of great business districts in our community that um, just need a little bit more investment in, uh, in them and that will help drive more traffic to our neighborhoods like Garland or South Perry or Hilliard. Um, these are neighborhoods that everybody uses and cherishes. So that investment will really benefit uh, the whole community. There's also great infrastructure uh, investments around our community centers that are used by lots of diverse populations and investment in our municipal court, our potential municipal court. I'm sure Council Member Kinnear will talk more about that. But um, this just shows a really big commitment um, to our community and getting these dollars out to people that have been impacted by COVID and an investment of long-term uh, gains to, to Spokane and the greater community. I think you okay. were teed up, Councilmember Kinnear. Pressure's on, so I too will be supporting this. We don't always get everything we want. There have been a lot of compromises along the way for this. However, I think it's a good mix of, of things that everyone can pick something and say, I really support this. I agree, the higher education piece is huge. It does move us forward. It does make us competitive going forward. And, <clears throat> excuse me, did you give me that frog? Okay. <laughs> and, the thing that really excites me is, as uh, Mr. Sabone said, uh, the Municipal Justice Center, right now our, our muni court, our judges, our prosecutors, our defenders are risking their lives every day because we, where they are working is unsafe. And so for me, this has been years working on this to find some place that they can have and grow into and a building that is perfect for their needs. So I am excited and I'm looking forward to voting yes. Anything for us, Councilmember Stratton? I think everybody said it, but right. thanks to the ARPA group, because I know this has been um, quite an experience with all this money trying to figure out what to do with it, so I appreciate it. But pretty much I'm gonna support it and because right. of what everybody else said. <clears throat> all right, it's great. Well, I just wanna mention a little <clears throat> bit of background because uh, we got this money over a year ago, or at least the first half of it, and um, we've pushed several tens of millions out the door, but this is the biggest tranche, and this is the one most focused on the community. And for those of you who, who weren't following it close, we, we started out with a very robust uh, online campaign to get people's ideas and thoughts, and then they would rank other people's ideas and thoughts through a tool called Thought Exchange. And then um, we held uh, several town hall meetings. One was virtual. Uh, we had one at... Um, Rogers, one at North Central, and one at Ferris. And then we hired uh, specifically uh, outreach uh, coordinator to especially reach out to communities that are historically marginalized. We deployed um, Alex Gibalisco from our office, who's our um, manager of equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. Uh, Lisa Gardner, who's our communications director and uh, community engagement, and they met with many groups and people and tried to understand what the needs were. And as you, you already heard that, you know, these are helping the community centers. Um, it's helping a different kind of municipal court system where people could actually park and that have offices for uh, treatment and interventions for people so that we treat people holistically and help them reclaim their lives in the community. Um, it's but I think some of the biggest things in the end, as Councilmember Zappone uh, mentioned, we really focused a lot on smaller businesses. So we really w went the money, wanted the money to go to neighborhood business districts. 
those of you who are watching closely, the CARES Act, which was earlier in COVID, a lot of that money went to larger businesses. They were technically smaller uh, by law, but they seemed to be larger. They had lawyers and accountants that could apply for the money. And we really wanted to focus this on the entities that maybe weren't as sophisticated, just kind of everyday people. And so we focused on the neighborhood business districts, and we focused on much smaller businesses for $5 million in grants and smaller nonprofits, $5 million. And we got lots of great input, and I'm super happy that it looks like we're going to have a 7-0 vote to move forward. And with that, you can prepare to vote. All right, seven to zero. Excellent. <clears throat> All right, we have another special budget ordinance coming. Ordinance C36247, general fund number one, decrease the appropriation for a community program coordinator position in the Office of Neighborhood Services by $28,000. Two, increase the appropriation for postage in the Office of Neighborhood Services by $5,000. Three, increase the appropriation for operating supplies in the Office of Neighborhood Services by $5,000. Four, increase the appropriation for software in the Office of Neighborhood Services by $4,500. Five, increase the appropriation for an operating transfer out in the Office of Neighborhood Services by $13,500. A, there is no change to the overall appropriation level in the general fund. And Management Information Services Fund, number one, increased revenue for an operating transfer in an Innovation and Technology Services Department by $13,500. Two, increase the appropriation for software maintenance in the Innovation and Technology Services Department by $13,500. B, this is an increase to the overall appropriation level in the Management Information Services Fund. This action arises from the need to transfer budget authority from personnel to non-personnel expenses for various operating needs. All right, there's no community comment. Any council commentary? Prepare to vote. All right, <clears throat> seven to zero. That brings us to another special budget ordinance. Ordinance C36249, general fund un unallocated reserves, number one, increase operating transfer out by $3,128,000. A of the increased appropriation, $3,128,000 is to be transferred to the Police Property Acquisition Fund for the purchase and commissioning of the following police vehicles. A, up to 46 4 K8 electric hybrid models and Police Property Acquisition Fund, one, increased revenue by $3,128,000. A, $3,128,000 of the increased revenue is from a transfer in from general fund unallocated reserves. Two, increase appropriations by $3,128,000. A, $3,128,000 of the increased appropriation is to be used solely for the purchase and commissioning of the following police vehicles. One, up to 46 Ford K8 hybrid or Ford mach -E models. This action arises from the need to purchase and commission police vehicles. I'm just noticing some language and Major McNabb <coughs> had pointed this out, but we didn't get it in there. If you look at the very top where it says A, up to 46 Ford K8 electric hybrid models, but below we gave them the option for or Ford Mach-E models. And I'm just looking for a motion to so add that same language. Yeah, so moved. Second. Okay, any discussion about that? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. There's no uh, community comment on this. Um, again, this would, um, we've been talking about this for a while, but with the supply chain issues in vehicles, uh, there is a very brief window opening up, we think, in the next week or so. Uh, and the police department wanted to be able to have authority to order models for the next few years of increases. And um, this would put the financial authorization to do so. It wouldn't spend the money right away because they would have to actually be delivered. And we don't even know if we'll get all of the ones that we order. Uh, but it would give the department the option to order the hybrid uh, ones, which are kind of a bridge, and then also the fully electric mach -E's if they couldn't get those. So that is the summary. Any council commentary? Council Member Kinnear. <clears throat> Thank you. We've worked on this for quite a while. We've been working on the whole concept of how do we order police vehicles so, so that's sustainable, so we're not having to order bunches of them at a time, but met them out over a period of years. And 
So this will hopefully catch us up to where we need to be so that we can go to a better model of ordering cars. And to say that there's a backlog or there's a supply chain issue is an understatement because there's a two-year wait. So and even with a two-year wait, we're not guaranteed to get everything that's ordered. So I think it's crucial that we do this now so that we're at least we get something going forward and our police aren't um, walking to, to emergency calls. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna support, um, I'm gonna support this, but I guess the, the, the biggest piece is taking this out of our unappropriated uh, <coughs> uh, reserves is gonna be pretty tough on our, our budget and we're already in a very tight budget. The problem is, you know, the prudent thing here and, and the difficult decision we have is that we've got a week basically to make this choice uh, when that window opens. And it's been very challenging for our police department to get access to vehicles. We authorized a purchase several uh, months ago and really the window closed before they were able to, to even execute. So it's, it's pretty critical that we get these ordered, but I'm committed to working for the next few months uh, before our next budget is adopted to identify a revenue source of some kind that we can tie this to that is not reserves. And um, hopefully others on this council agree and we can, we can identify what that is and work together to, to make that connection. But I, I, it does make me incredibly nervous to leave this connected to unallocated reserves. Unfortunately, it really is the only option we have, uh, barring ARPA, which uh, that did not, I, I proposed an amendment on that earlier today and that did not pass. But uh, barring ARPA, there really is no other option today. And so we have to get the, the orders made. And so we're, we're just, we're up against it. Uh, but I am committed to making sure that, that this is a, a fiscally sound decision um, uh, once it's completed, so. Other commentary, Council Member Wilkerson. Thank you, so I echo Councilor McCatcart. <coughs> This coming out of reserves gives me a little bit of heartburn also. But what I really want to get out there is this just didn't happen this year with this backlog of police vehicles. This has happened over several administrations, according to the police, that they would ask for cars and they would only get a portion of the cars that they were asked for. And so this problem has just continued to just build up. And now this council, is here to solve this challenge before our police department right now. So I will be voting for it, but our city is in a challenging financial position. As I've said, the economy recovery was not even for everyone. So everybody didn't bounce back as quickly as some others did. And that includes our city. So going forward, I agree we need to find another revenue source, or we have to be ready to cut in other places. Councilmember Bingle. Um, everything everybody has said is, is spot on and it's accurate. Um, and I appreciate that, um, that I think we have the votes to make this happen. So I've basically been asking for one thing from ARPA since I got into office, which was, uh, you know, police vehicles. Uh, we know how, um, how far behind um, we are on keeping those updated. And as Councilwoman Wilkerson said, this isn't something that happened overnight. Um, and so I'm glad that we're taking steps to address it. Just to reiterate some things that were said as well. Um, pulling from unallocated reserves is gonna, is gonna give us a challenge. And um, while that might not be the ultimate funding source, that's uh, you know the one that we're looking at right now. Um, I really think there should have been out of ARPA, but I'm just happy that it's, that it's happening. I, I appreciate everybody in the council um, you know, supporting this and, and getting it forward because um, we do need to, to make those investments in our, in our police to ensure that we have um, as safe a community as possible. And so um, while it's not my favorite funding source, I'm excited that it's here and I'm glad that it's gonna happen, so. Anyone else? Council members Zappone. Yeah, I will also be supporting this, but have uh, reservations for other reasons. I'm glad it's not coming from ARPA because that's funds that we could not have given out to the community, to those impacted by it. Uh, from the city poorly managing our services. I think it's important to be getting um, the money out to the community, whether it's small businesses, higher education investment, our neighborhoods. Uh, so I, I was really against it going from our funding because that we would have had to reduce it somewhere else. Um, I have concerns about 
how efficient we are with our, our police cars. So I'm excited that we're, we have a study that hopefully we'll get back in a few months that can tell us how to more efficiently use our police cars and hopefully that'll save us funding long term. Anyone else? Just to be clear, I think we're all nervous about taking from reserves. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but again, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. And as he said, we want to make sure that our community is served as well. Uh, just a couple of things. One, we have already used ARPA, several millions of dollars of ARPA for police vehicles, and then another several million for fire. So it's not that we kept it on. But we did that. We went through a process of uh, evaluating and rating among council members of what the remaining money should go to. And this had some strong support, but not quite majority support. Uh, and so that's why Councilmember Kinnear and I tried to find another way and to follow up on some of the other comments from council members. We, um, in 2020, when uh, many of us came into our current terms and with this administration, we had a sustainable uh, vehicle plan where we, every year we took the increase in property taxes, which is limited to 1% or about 500,000, and then we matched it with 500,000 from the general fund. So year one, we put 1 million, year two, 2 million, year three, three, and it was just going up. And it was on track to get us to sustainable for fire and police. And this administration decided to go away from that under pressure of COVID. Now, it was a real pressure, but they went away from that. And so we lost the plan and we lost track of it, essentially. And, and that's part of what's going on. Part of it, previous administration just didn't let the vehicles be purchased. But part of it is we've lost that. So what I'm uh, suggesting this proposal is we'll get us the vehicles on order and it will give us time to come up with that sustainable plan. And it could be uh, internal loans, it could be other revenue sources, but I think we owe it to the community and the police and fire departments to figure out a sustainable plan. And that's, this gives us that. Uh, and other things that we were going to use our reserves on, we probably still could use for ARPA, so it should balance out. But we really wanted to deal with that crazy uh, window that's coming that was beyond any planning for. So with that, prepare to vote. Just, oh, sorry. sorry. Real quick, just to put in perspective. So we had the Tahoe's that we approved earlier. That window was open for t like 24 hours, like yeah. literally 24 hours. That's why it's important for us to be. Yeah. 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 Prepare to vote. All right. That passes seven to zero. Major McNabb will be very happy. <laughs> All right, we've got another special budget ordinance. One more. Ordinance C36250, general fund number one, decrease the appropriation for director of human resources position in the human resources department by $31,000. Two, decrease the appropriation for labor relations manager position in the human resources department by $30,000. Three, increase the appropriation for an operating transfer out by $61,000. A, there is no change to the overall appropriation level in the general fund and management information services. Increase for an operating transfer in in the innovation and technology services by $61,000. Two, increase the appropriation for software maintenance by $61,000. B, this is an increase to the overall appropriation level in the management information services fund. This action arises from adding a learning management system in the NeoGov contract. All right, and this is the funding source for the contract we just approved in the consent agenda. <clears throat> There's no community comment, any council commentary? Prepare to vote. All right, and that passes seven to zero, and that, we did have an emergency ordinance scheduled on facilities, but we deferred that to August 22nd uh, for further tinkering with the language at the request of the Public Works Division. And that brings us to resolutions. Resolution 2022-71, creating a policy to establish a language access plan to ensure limited English proficiency residents have access to the city's services, information, and civic processes, guidelines on using interpretation and translation services by city. Uh, we only have one speaker for that. Randy McGlenn, you can come up, but I don't know if Councilmember Cathcart, if you wanted to tee this up for us. Yeah, um, so first off, thanks to uh, Alex Jibalisco for all of his work uh, in helping to pull this together um, and the, the Human Rights Commission for, for the input that they provided. 
Uh, essentially, what this says is that we need to provide language access for uh, those languages that are at least a threshold of three and a half percent um, of our population or higher. Um, there is an exception for, uh, I believe, the Marshallese community to make sure that we have something in there to um, enable them to to communicate um, with us as well. So, I mean, really, this is a, a pretty straightforward proposal just to make sure that our city is up to speed uh, with, with the Title VI requirements at the federal level, uh, but also just ensuring uh, community access to, to government, so. All right, Mr. McGlenn. Thank you, Council President, Council Members. I am so excited that this came before us tonight and my neighborhood, East Central, will benefit the most from this ordinance. So thank you, Council Members, and uh, I can't wait to get started to using that service. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to support this uh, tonight. Um, you know, this really, I think, came about during the CARES Act discussions that we had and realizing just how many um, uh, vulnerable community members we had that really did not have language access uh, to either the work we were doing to try and get access to those CARES dollars or uh, rental assistance or you know, any of the stuff that we were trying to do uh, to support the community. And so it really kind of rose up as a, as a high need. And, and so over the course of those two years, working with Alex Jibalisco, our uh, diversity and equity coordinator for the city council, um, He's, he's helped to put this uh, <clears throat> really important resolution together uh, that, as I mentioned, will provide that language access for those community groups that reach 3.5% or, or higher. Um, and, you know, what, what really strikes me is that I think a key component of government um, is, is making sure that everybody has access, right? Everybody deserves access to their government. And we want to make sure that we're set up in a way that people can attend our meetings and know what's going on. They can get access to documents and understand, you know, how those are gonna impact them, their families, their livelihoods, that sort of thing. And, and really, it's, it's been kind of a bare bones situation. We've had contracts with interpreters and things like that, but it's been a very bare bones, minimalist kind of thing. And I think it's really important that we're providing this access. Um, my wife is, uh, her, she's Vietnamese and her family, uh, she's first generation born in America. And, when her parents came here uh, to Spokane, they wanted to open a business, a restaurant. And so Vina, my wife, was the one who, at I think 16, 17, was coming to City Hall and talking to permitting and talking to planning and talking to the health district and was the one doing all of that because her parents had very limited ability to communicate. And so it's just really important. I mean, that, that's, an, that's an impact to business growth, that's an impact to all different kinds of facets of our community. And, and so there is just a myriad of reasons why we wanna make sure that a policy like this is in place. Um, in fact, I can recall uh, a, a nonprofit organization was trying to translate some documents into uh, Middle Eastern, didn't have the, the funding for it. I actually took it out of my council fund to make sure that we could get that done because it's just really important that everybody has the ability to access their government. And so I'm just pleased to, to have this finally coming forward. Um, I trust that uh, Jarrell, our uh, civil rights coordinator, is going to do a great job of implementing this over the next few months uh, and, and bringing this to fruition. So I'm grateful to everybody on the city council for, for the support um, to date on this and, and that we're able to, to execute. So thank you all very much. I'll just do a quick uh, echo a lot of what Councilman Catcart said, but truly when COVID hit and the CARES Act money started coming to our city, and we were trying to get information out, we really realized the gap that we had to our communities of color, or English was not their first language. And so we realized how fragmented the system is in the city, and not just because it was CARES money, which was important, but as Councilmember Katkar said, other departments in our government did not have, provide access to people who did not understand English. And I thought that was a real challenge. So as we go forward, and what this also did is start bringing our communities of color more into our government, where they feel a part of it, because we were leaning on them to communicate within their own communities. And that only makes Spokane stronger when every community is part of our government in our city. And as Council Member, uh, Council President Begg says, 
everybody belongs. Any other comments? I'll just grab this as a great partnership. I really appreciate everyone's work in moving this forward. Prepare to vote. All right. That passes seven to zero. Uh, then we have a resolution, I believe, for the very late breaking. Uh, we realized that uh, we had to get something to the auditor uh, with the committees to um, pro and con on the ballot measure, whether or not the city of Spokane should have a more independent city attorney. And council member Bingle and I scrambled today to get pro and con people, and we finally literally got the names and emails with <laughs> only minutes ago. So this isn't posted anywhere, so uh, the clerk will need to read the resolution, it's not binding on anything other than setting up these groups to come up with 175 word statements. Okay. Resolution number 2022-72, a resolution regarding the appointment of for and against committee members relating to the ballot measure on the November 8, 2022 general election regarding a proposition regarding amendments to sections 24, 28, 29, and 33 and repeal of section 32 of the Spokane City Charter relating to the appointment duties and powers of the city attorney and other legal counsel and approving the explanatory statement prepared by the city attorney, whereas the city council approved resolution number 2022-69 on July 25, 2022, requesting the Spokane County Auditor to hold a special election on November 8, 2022 for the city to submit to the voters a proposition regarding amendments to sections 24, 28, 29, and 33 and repeal of section 32 of the Spokane City Charter relating to the appointment duties and powers of the city attorney and other legal counsel. And whereas pursuant to the Spokane County Local Voters Pamphlet Administrative Rules of jurisdic for Jurisdictions, adopted pursuant to RCW 29A.32.230, the city is required to appoint committees for and against the city attorney proposition to provide an explanatory statement of the ballot measure prepared by the city attorney and to submit the committee appointments and explanatory statement to the Spokane County Elections Department by August 2nd, 2022. And now therefore be it resolved that the city council appoints the following members to the for and against committees to prepare arguments in favor of an opposition and in opposition to the ballot proposition as well as rebuttal statements consistent with the Spokane County Local Voters Pamphlet Administrative Rules. The for against committee membership appointment form as provided for by the Spokane County Elections Department shall be attached to this resolution. Be it further resolved that the City Council approves the explanatory statement provided below as prepared by the City Attorney to be forwarded to, forwarded to the Spokane County Elections Department for inclusion in the local voters pamphlet. Be it further resolved that the City Clerk is directed to deliver a certified copy of this resolution to the Spokane County Auditor no later than August 2, 2022. City Attorney Proposition for Committee, number one, Karen Lindholt, number two, Rick Eichstad, number three, Brian Beggs. City Attorney Proposition Against Committee, number one, Jonathan Bingle, number two, Bill Hissop, number three, Jim McDevitt. Explanatory Statements for City of Spokane, Proposition number one, Amendment to the City Charter regarding the City, city Attorney. Proposition number one, submits to the voters a ballot measure to amend the requirements and process set out in the Spokane City Charter regarding the appointment, duties, and powers of the City Attorney and other legal counsel as set forth in Ordinance C36244. The city charter would be amended to provide that the city council would appoint the city attorney upon agreement of the mayor to a seven year term and could remove the city attorney with agreement of the mayor prior to the expiration of the seven year term only for just cause by a vote of a majority plus one of the city council. The proposition sets forth the duties of the city attorney including commencement and settlement of significant litigation upon the prior approval of the city council and the mayor. The proposition further provides the ability of the mayor and city council to separately employ special legal counsel independent of the city attorney to advise and represent the mayor and city council in matters related to their respective official capacity or interest. Okay, great. All right, there's no public comment on any council commentary. All right, prepare to vote. All right, that brings us that seven to zero, and that brings us to we have one first reading ordinance where we have one person testifying, but go ahead and read it. Ordinance C36243 relating to multiple, fa multiple family housing property tax exemption amending Spokane Municipal Code sections 8.02.0695 
All right, we have one uh, person, Dave M., who's calling in. Dave, if you're there, if you want to hit star three. Dave, if you're there, one more chance. All right. Then that will bring us, that's the end of our legislative agenda. We're now in open forum, and we have plenty of you who want to test. Oh, all right, Dave. Welcome back to City Council. Dave, you have up to three minutes. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and pass on this. I'm okay. sorry. All right, no worries. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Um, Okay, as I said, several of you have signed up. Uh, many of you uh, were here last week, so um, glad you could make it back, and I'm sorry that was such a long meeting uh, and you didn't get to testify. But we've got several of you, and I'm gonna, if you remember last week, or if you weren't here, I, what I like to do is call uh, people up three at a time. Jacoby, could you open up that one other seat there so people, so there's gonna be two seats up here you can uh, be waiting for so we can maximize speaking time and minimize walking time. Uh, but the first um, person is Rick Bocook. If you're here, come on up. And then next is William, it looks like Hagee, and then Karen Carlberg. I was uh, reading about the irony of um, this cooling tent at Camp Hope, you know, about wanted to charge Washington State like over $500 a day um, to say it's illegal. But the, all the tents there are illegal, so why are they even doing that? Especially to the state that's going to be putting up $24 million. Why would they want to do that? <clears throat> but I'm also thinking about my past because I'm only like one generation from people that came over on covered wagons, pioneer stock, um, people that were raised in the depressions. And it's the the story is similar about the homeless population here because there was a mass migration during the depression days in the Dust Bowls. And uh, one of the group of people that really got targeted were people from Oklahoma, they were called Okies, people from Arkansas. Um, they were really treated like garbage. And it was basically the same story. They're criminal, I'm gonna use the proper English term. They're criminals, you know, <clears throat> and um, they're just bringing bad things to our community. You're, this, this, is, this is history. I don't think people read history, but the people that are coming against homeless people, they're repeating history. And they wanna do harm to their fellow man because they don't like the way they are. They don't like the way they're surviving. And I, I just don't, I don't understand. And then, then okay, I don't wanna to speak too much against Christianity, but a lot of people that are in Christianity are doing the most targeting. And it's garbage too, you know. Anyway, I think that people should come together a little bit more and have more compassion. And realize even in this big city, um, there's always a certain percentage of people in a city that are, are doing crime. And it's no more different than a small community. It's the same thing. <clears throat> and then there's the people that do the crime that are in business suits that they never talk about. Those ones. Those are the ones you never hear talked about, but they're here too. Thank you. Thank you. And then William is next. And then Karen. She wants to go first? That's okay. <clears throat> Welcome, Karen, and after Karen is William, and then looks like Kathy Hagee as well after that. Yeah. Welcome. So I'm Karen Carlberg. I'm the chair of the West Hills Neighborhood Council, and I'm going to give an introduction for several of my neighbors who are going to be speaking about this topic. Most of you know that there are proposals for four different facilities for the West Hills Neighborhood with either low-income apartments or 
recently homeless people. And we are here to ask that that be reduced. Four is too many for any neighborhood. We know we need to find places for these people. We know it's urgent. But to put that many people in one neighborhood is too much to ask. And my neighbors are going to tell you all of the reasons for that. Now, those four facilities include low-income apartments with Catholic charities at the bottom of Sunset Hill, movement of people from Camp Hope to the Ascenda facility a little ways up the hill on Sunset Boulevard, the Quality Inn with people coming from Camp Hope at the top of Sunset Hill. Those three, those three facilities are within less than one mile of one another. And then we learned last week that there is a proposal for Catholic Charities to move people from Camp Hope to the existing low-income apartment complex on Wistalk's Way. We think this should be spread out among more neighborhoods. And my neighbors will tell you the effects that they think this will have on our neighborhood. Now, I think all of you also have heard that we West Hills Neighborhood Council people were not consulted at all in the planning of a lot of this. And we learned about the quality in from the spokesman review. We learned about the Wistalks Way proposal for people from Camp Hope from some River Run neighbors, neighbors at, a, at a meeting last week. And we have had promises from the city administration as well as from Catholic Charities at our neighborhood council meetings and this is in our minutes, that they would engage us, engage us in any of the planning for these kinds of facilities, and they did not. Karen, your time is up okay. now, but yep. thank you for coming down. We'll look forward to hearing from your neighbors. Uh, so William, and after William, uh, Kathy Hagee, and after Kathy, it looks like Shay Suski. Yes, uh, uh, Council President and Council Members, I thank you for this opportunity to voice testimony on behalf of the West Hills Neighborhood Council as well as the residents and businesses of West Hills as Vice Chair of the West Hills Neighborhood Council. Uh, I have listened to a great uh, amount of opposition has come to my attention as Vice Chair on the West Hills Neighborhood Council against two or more proposed projects and developments reading into the Roe Initiative by way of a prepackaged plan to bring a permanent and or otherwise referred to as emergency low barrier housing opportunities to the West Hills. Opposition regarding the estimated 14, point, uh, 14 million of state funding being awarded to Catholic Charities for the proposed 86 room motel on Sunset Boulevard has indicated a number of levels of conflict and opposition regarding uh, and, and in reference to the Fair Housing Act itself and suspected levels of di discrimination uh, by way of proposed resident selection, participation process, and showing exclusivity to one portion of the group that is to be interviewed. Disabilities Act further shows discrimination prevention of services, uh, lack of supported environmental impact, traffic study, or community engagement with residences, businesses, or even the West Hills neighborhood officers. Uh, and prejudice shown towards existing residents and or business owners by showing further exclusivity to one group being catered to and introduced to the other. Uh, Catholic Charities of Eastern Washington listed as a recipient approximately 14 million of the 24 million in state funding directed to further support the 600 individuals at Camp Hope. As indicated by Catholic Charities to accommodate as few as 110 to 130. Public health and safety concerns regarding the relocation of the 598, whereas the 598 of 601 interviews 
conducted at Camp Hope showing that they don't have valid ID, social security card, possession of driver's license or otherwise, in what uh, gives residents and business owners alike concerns for their family, children, elderly, disabled, including way of life. Further indications as to the lengthy history of failed projections or promised result-driven metrics surrounding business operations found and confirmed to both lack policy and or policy enforcement on behalf of Catholic Charities in themselves. What further conflicts both with the Fair Housing Act as well as a number of points in RCW 24.03A.150, both 2A and B, given both the inability to act on, by, behalf of corporate officers, including challenging the ability to act as a nonprofit organization. All right, Mr. Hagee, your time's you. up for today. Thank you so much for coming down. And is Kathy Hagee here or not? I'm not seeing. Okay, it looks like Shay. Shay, come on up, Susky. Uh, and go ahead and introduce yourself and what city you're from. After Shay is Gib Brumbach and then Michael Holland. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Greetings, uh, City Council. My uh, name is Shay Susky, and my wife and I live in the West Hills neighborhood of Spokane. I am here as a resident of this neighborhood to express our concerns about the city's proposal for funding from the Department of Commerce to relocate, by my account, almost 40% of those in Camp Hope to various facilities along Sunset Boulevard in the West Hills neighborhood. The quality and conversion by Catholic Charities to shelter roughly 120 people is the most pressing project as it has moved at an unprecedented speed. The site is not near services people would need. The pedestrian environment to get to the nearest services presents a dangerous situation, and we are concerned about the impacts to, uh, to nearby regional assets such as Finch Arboretum, High Bridge Park, the Dog Park, uh, Fish Lake Trail, which the city will be investing millions into in the next few years. I also want to draw attention to the Empire Health Foundation's funding ask for 75 pallet homes to house 125 people along Sunset Boulevard as the reporting of this ask has lacked detail to this point. This organization, which cooperates as Sunset Health LLC, owns the Ascenda property and land behind it in the northwest corner of Sunset and Government Way, which is where this project would go. But to many in the neighborhood, the concern is not just about one project. It's the totality of what already occurs in the neighborhood and what is planned for the West Hills. The neighborhood currently experiences impacts due to the proximity of the Cannon Street shelter and we also deal with illegal dumping and drug use on our streets because of our wonderful natural assets also unfortunately provide seclusion. The two projects I've referenced would shelter nearly 250 people along Sunset Boulevard combined with other plans by Catholic Charities along this corridor and the neighborhood as a whole are effectively dictating a new vision for the Sunset Boulevard and surrounding community without any public engagement. There are other similar properties along Sunset that could easily join these projects as well. Surely even those in favor of such projects can sympathize with our neighborhood's frustration over the lack of transparency and engagement on decisions that will impact the direction of our neighborhood for decades, if not longer. We are frankly very confused about how this process took place, who is responsible and when during this process, and why we haven't been engaged up to this point. Some engagement with the city and entities in this proposal is starting to materialize, and we are thankful for these opportunities, but we are still concerned this may be too late. Funding has already been approved for the quality and conversion, and we have recently learned that nearly $100 million in private development along the corridor, which could provide upwards of 500 units of housing and additional retail, has screeched to a halt and may disappear entirely as a result of the projects I've referenced. I urge whoever in the city has the authority, whether it be the city council or the mayor or both, to do whatever is possible to halt these projects I've referenced until adequate engagement with residents has occurred. I also urge all involved to consider the cumulative impacts of not only the projects submitted to, uh, to the Department of Commerce, but other projects outside of the proposal as well, as, and how they may lead to the additional facilities along the corridor that could, uh, excuse me, could overburden our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shay. And then Gib Brumbach, and then Michael Holland, and then Sam Evans. Welcome. Thank you, President Biggs. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not here to offend anybody. I, I respect what you do. I, I can talk about transparency, which has not taken place at all. I will mention one thing only because it was on the news about two weeks ago when the mayor was stating that uh, 
in her situation, uh, it, it would appear that they had total support from our neighborhood. Abs, I don't know where the information came from. You've heard from the uh, board and the chair tonight. It is absolutely not true. I'd like to switch now to business. You talked about money tonight, and we all have those problems. At this point in time, I have land uh, to build 232 units that are five-story buildings, three different projects. Uh, I bought the 25,000 square foot office building uh, as you come off the Garden Springs three years ago. It was 100% empty. I gutted it and turned it into a beautiful office building and except for a unit, it's full. Now I have lessees coming to me. We are locking down the building where you can't even get in. Uh, UPS, they've got a call. You no longer can get in the building and we have people coming into the bathrooms, which we're also putting uh, security on so nobody can even get in the bathrooms unless they have proper codes. Uh, we ask our tenants, please don't leave your cars overnight uh, because of vandalism problems. I work with a large group of people, uh, good relationship with, with, with them. I don't mind competition at all, it makes us all better. It's very important to understand that I literally know of more than 500 units uh, that are coming to our area in the next three to four years. I have 232 of them. Bill Lawson, who did the beautiful project up on top of the, of the Motel 6, et cetera, he has, uh, he's bought land for 150. Uh, he has told me if this passes, he's gone. He absolutely is gone. Uh, we have tabled all three of our projects, and we just finished a pre-development meeting with the city of Spokane to do 72 units next to our office building, which is be next to the, the uh, Quality Inn. Uh, all of our projects are not now tabled. At 200,000 a unit, and I'm sorry to say it, that's what it costs now to build apartments, $200,000 a unit at 500 plus units. That's $100 million in tax base for this city. And I Mr. want you Burnback. to take that into consideration. Uh, Th wish I had an hour. Yep. Thank Th you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for coming down. Um, Michael Holland, then Sam Evans, and then Susan Hardy. Good evening, President, Hi. and members of the Spokane City Council. I, um, we moved to, my name is Michael Holland, yes, and we moved to Spokane on July 1st, 1984, and I uh, have lived in our house on the corner of Woodridge and Navajo off the of North Indian Trail uh, for 38 years. I'm concerned about traffic infrastructure and emergency services being affected by proposed modifications to Falcon Ridge North PN-1967-05 and Woodridge View um, PN-196-05. I know that these lie on the county side of the line adjacent <coughs> to the city boundary, but these proposed modifications want to add an additional 165 lots to the already approved 122 um, uh, lots in the city. Our deep concern is that there is no road and no existing plan to build a road on the county side of these proposed uh, additional 165 lots. So the question is, does this mean that Spokane County Sheriff's Department, Spokane County Fire District, Mead Schools and Waste Management will all have to travel around the hill either way and access the city uh, roads to service these additional homes? The access roads seem to be Weber Drive, that has only two one-way one lanes that are 17 and a half feet wide, separated by a median with trees, Navajo Drive, Shawnee Drive, and Woodridge Drive, all exiting onto North Indian Trail. My request is that you ask the county commission to postpone these proposed modifications until they build, build a road with access from the county side, at least, um, do studies on traffic infrastructure and emergency services. Thank you very much 
for your service, for listening to me, and special thank yous to Jacoby Bird, Assistant to Council Member Kinnear, and Jeff Gunn, Assistant to Council Member Zapone, because they graciously each return my phone calls and courteously talk to me. So you know what that counts for. So any questions? Yep. So. Thank you so much for coming down. Thank you. All right, Sam Evans, and then Susan Hardy, and then James Reinhardt. Thank you, council members. It's an honor to be here. Um, so as Karen said, I'm a neighbor resident in the West Hills neighborhood. Um, I first came to Spokane when I was 18 to study at Gonzaga University, immediately fell in love, um, got my degree, and I've been working really hard since. And uh, a couple years ago, I, bought, I was able to buy my first home, and that was in West Hills. And the reason I, I wanted to live there was because it's a beautiful place. Um, it's close to downtown. There's lots of uh, green. I love, I love golf. The Arbor, Arbor, Arboreum is there. I can never say that word right. Um, there's Palisades Park where I take my dog mountain biking every morning. And it's just a gorgeous place. And it's safe and it's, it's really clean. Um, and when I started hearing about everything that's going on with the Quality Inn and the, the tiny pallet homes, I got really scared. It, it terrified me. It terrified me so much that I decided to, to go to Camp Hope today, and I spent you know an hour there, and I walked through it, talked to people, and it's pretty rough, and I hope all of you guys have spent you know, time there, and I, I think you have you know, volunteered. And um, you know, I, I, I spoke with the policemen, and you know, they just told me how it has affected that community in terms of vandalism, theft, um, drug use in, in, in such a bad way. Um, they, they don't sell certain items at, at many of the stores around there. And, you know, I, I don't want that to, to be brought to, to West Hills, our neighborhood. Um, you know, it's going to make a lot of those parks unsafe, you know, where, where homeless people could potentially hide or, or just camp out, you know, whatever. Um, and not to mention, there's really no resources, um, you know, up at the Quality Inn. It's a long walk when it's hot, when it's cold, when it's icy, when it's snowy. Um, you know, it, it's just, it, you know, it forces people to walk through neighborhoods um, and, and, you know, it, who knows what their state of mind is, right? It, it, at uh, Camp Hope today, it, there, were, there was a lot of drug use. And you know what people do when they're on drugs? They don't think clearly. Um, so I really ask you, I beg you to, to really consider what's going to happen um, before we move, you know, forward with these projects. Um, we need to revitalize Spokane. And, you know, I, I don't think this is the right way to do it. I want to be forward thinking. I want to grow up, you know, I want to spend the rest of my life here. I want my kids to live here, and I don't want to have to worry about, um, you know, the safety of, of the beautiful neighborhood we have today at West Hill. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. Susan Hardy, come on up. James Reinhardt, and then it looks like Jennifer, maybe Colvin. Calvert. Calvert, sorry. Welcome. Hi, I'm Susan Hardy. And I'm a retired Air Force nurse and the captain of the Palisades Neighborhood Watch. And I'm here in support of West Hills as we also learned about the same time they did that, that things are changing for us. And I wanted to come and, and state that I know that this is urgent and this is a very sensitive situation. I, my heart is broken for how broken everything is. Um, what, what we're concerned about is that we, we want to be part of this decision and we feel there, that boundaries need to be established. I could talk for an hour on the things that I've had to dealt with, deal with as the Neighborhood Watch Captain. Um, just last week, uh, um, we heard a ding and I went thinking I was going to be seeing my nephews and, I, and I, 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 I'm standing there with their, the refrigerator doors open and I'm expecting as soon as the door closes to see my nephews and it was a homeless man in our house with the, the refrigerator open. So um, I, uh, we had just gotten home and the door was open because we were bringing food in. We usually keep it always locked. But we're starting to see this happen more. And down the road uh, in our neighborhood, watch one of um, the neighbors uh, the car, their car was broken into, and also another neighbor 
found on their surveillance camera, the same individual in their backyard. I have a four-year-old granddaughter. We're starting to find needles and drugs. Um, we're finding more people uh, using our basalt Rimrock area as a corridor, you know, to get from Sunset into the park. And it, it's just been really rough and we're asking for boundaries um, and help because even our police force um, is, is really struggling to get to us when we call. So thank you so much for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. All right, James Reinhardt and then Jennifer Calvert and then Justin O'Connor. Good evening, council members, and thank you for your time. Uh, my name is James Reinhardt. Uh, I, too, am a nurse. I work at Sacred Heart. Uh, I'm a resident of West Hills. I'm just right next to the Finch Arboretum. Um, I have a loving wife, and I have three beautiful kids. They're four and three and one. Uh, I come from northern Idaho, raised there, where you know you could find a tree and use that as your bathroom, and nobody really cared. Um, we left our doors unlocked. Uh, coming to Spokane, where my wife is from, we lock our doors more. Uh, I, I agree that there is maybe an uptick in people that are that are sleeping in their cars, and, and that's and that's okay. And there's uh, an uptick of people walking on Sunset Boulevard, and, and that's okay. Um, but uh, my issues are uh, the low barrier or no barrier housing that would be put on just on the other side of of the park where my kids and I go on my days off. Um, that's no barriers or low barriers to background checks, uh, to criminal history, uh, to drug screens. Um, and just that that means that there's also not a, not a barrier, not a, a geographical barrier between these people uh, and my kids. Um, and I'm not going to classify all who use drugs, all have mental health issues, and all have criminal history to be a bad person. Um, but I know that it just takes one needle. Uh, it just takes one uh, indecent exposure. It just takes one act of violence for me to lose my kids. Um, and I'm very aware of that. Um, as a nurse at Sacred Heart, we see lots. Um, as a cyclist, every day, I, even, I, I will take sandwiches that are expiring and distribute them to homeless people on my way home. It's great. But there's a distance between where I am with my bike, with pepper spray in hand, and my kids that are going to be playing in the backyard, my four and three year old that don't know the difference between an insulin needle and a stick yet. I haven't had to teach them that. I want to teach them to stay away from moose and skunks as opposed to staying away from people that are having shifting eyes and are missing some of their clothes. Um, I think that uh, what other, I, I'm not sure what city allows a low barrier facility to be in a neighborhood uh, next to homes, uh, retirees, elderly, etc. cetera. Um, I, I think my plea echoes those who have spoken more, eloqu more eloquently already. Uh, some transparency would be lovely so that we could feel that we're involved and to see what options there are. I heard about there being a facility on Trent uh, in an industrialized area that you could put security cameras around the equipment as opposed to security cameras around our, ch our children. Um, I would voice more uh, uh, thoughts of a gal who is not able to attend tonight, but uh, for time, please uh, help us with that transparency. Um, help us to find a spot for them that's closer to food, services, and jobs, um, and have a physical barrier, if not a, a barrier to the housing for our kids, neighborhoods, and family. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Jennifer Calvert, then Justin O'Connell, and then Cicely Hummer. Good evening. Uh, I'm Jennifer Calvert, and I'm here representing the League of Women Voters of the Spokane area. Um, uh, specifically, I want to be reading a letter that we sent to Nadine Woodward, and I hope all of you have received it as well. Uh, just let's uh, read it and uh, get some emphasis where it needs to be. Uh, so uh, for the last two years, the League of Women Voters of the Spokane area has made recommendations to the Spokane City Council concerning the unsheltered residents of our city. We've made three specific recommendations. We recommended first uh, to secure sufficient low barrier 24 seven shelter beds, including meals for unsheltered individuals. Two, provide places for unsheltered individuals to go during the day that are warm and dry or you know, cool. 
of, depending on the season, and three, provide sanctioned public places with trash disposal, toilets, and hand washing facilities where those experiencing homelessness can set up tents and or park their vehicles. Uh, because I hope that you realize that many individuals are not able to uh, take advantage of shelters that we might have. So I'm looking at the bigger picture here. Uh, currently, we're most concerned about that third recommendation, which is that they provide that we provide sanctioned public places for these people to be. The two proposals that have been submitted for revisions to the camping ordinance present varying rules that outline not only where the unsheltered cannot rest, but also deem these places illegal. Both proposals will restrict camping from one within 100 feet of railroad viaducts, two within 35 feet of the Spokane River or Latak Creek, three all city parks and city owned property, and four within three blocks of any congregate shelter. So the mayor's proposal goes further and expands these restrictions to include the boundaries of the business improvement district and the downtown police precinct. The focus of both proposals is on where residents cannot go. We prefer that the focus be put on where the unsheltered can safely and legally live while they engage with service providers to gain access to housing, employment, and other support. Um, I'm going to cut here because I'm a little afraid I'm going to be cut off. Um, we know that there are at least 20 properties in the city that could be immediately put to use for the needs of the unsheltered. And we strongly urge both City Council and Mayor Woodward to present options including but not limited to these 20 that have been uh, identified by an expert that we recently heard from where the unsheltered can legally exist. And we agree that ideally people experiencing homelessness should not camp in front of downtown businesses, rights of way, or in public parks. But our elected officials need to first inform these individuals where they can live while they engage with service providers, obtain necessities, excuse me, <coughs> necessary IDs and wait for housing to become available instead of updating ordinances to tell them where they cannot live. Whoops, I, my time is up. Right. Thank you very much. And so, yes, read your email. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Jennifer. All right, Justin O'Connell, Cicely Hummer, and is then Kim Schmidt. Two or three? Three minutes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your service, first mm -hmm. and foremost. Um, I work under Alexandria Stein at Central Dental. You might know her, and I wanted to speak tonight on uh, some, uh, not a topic that we've spoken about so far. So our city has voted three times no on community water fluoridation, and the fourth time, it couldn't even make it to the ballot. The mayor thinks this should go to a vote. It's 2022, for goodness sake. Not everything needs to go to a vote. Community water fluoridation is a human right. It is one of the top 10 public health accomplishments of the last century ever since we got the idea at Sachsenhausen. This is about oral justice and oral equity. People are dying because we don't have community water fluoridation. Do our children not deserve the same opportunity as others? Seattle has fluoridated their water for 50 years and they're booming. The science is settled. Yeah, we have people coming in here and citing the Harvard study. This Harvard study has been a pain for a while now, warning of potential neurological deficits when fluoride is consumed. That's why we need water fluoridation now. We can't have people coming in here and citing the Harvard study. There's some other studies in here as well I can pull up real quick. They're citing studies like um, epim epim epidemiology epidemiological studies in recent years have found negative associations between fluoride and cognitive development. There's studies out of Mexico and Canada which show these and we can't afford to have people coming in here and speaking about these studies any longer. So enough is enough. I developed an oral equity strategy. I believe that in the black, indigenous, and POC districts, and I say this as a Latinx myself, that we can do 700 parts per million fluoride in the water and the whites can have seven parts fluoride in the water. I think this is the way that we can lead Spokane towards oral equity. What we need then is for the mayor to go on the local rap and reggaeton stations and to send the children this message. Drink the water. Drink the tap water. Drink it. Drink it. In order to ensure oral equity and that parents don't filter the fluoride out of their children's water, we need to ban reverse osmosis machines. We can't trust the parents. Finally, I'm also sick of hearing about the river and the fluoride, the potential fluoride runoff. This is another example of human supremacy. So what if the fish get fluoridated and their teeth are strong too? The fish deserve oral equity also. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Justin. Mm -hmm. uh, Cicely Hummer, then Kim Schmidt, then Melanie. 
Hey. No, yeah. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cicely Hummer. Um, I'm a resident physician here in town. I moved here in 2020, right in the middle of COVID. So I got the fun time of being frontlines COVID as a new intern in the hospital. Um, when we moved here, um, I didn't really know what to expect. I came from Denver. Um, instantly, I loved it. So much so that my wife and I bought a house in West Hills. So sorry to kind of keep harping on the same point, but I don't know. Um, I know we're not the South Hill, but we've got a really good neighborhood. You guys have heard from a bunch of wonderful individuals. We've got young people. We've got old people. We've got people with kids. I want to have kids and live in that area. I think it's one of the best areas of town with all the places where we can get to the parks. I'm an avid cyclist. I'm always biking either to Fish Lake or um, on the trails going out to Idaho or up into the forests. It's awesome. It's also super close to downtown, which is why it's so much fun for young, young professionals. We can get out, we can go to dinner. It's super easy for me to get to the hospital. I love it, I think it's the best. Um, I think any community, if you put or try to put four shelters in a one mile radius would be worried about the exact same thing, especially when it just pops up overnight. We all hear about it on the news instead of from any sort of councilman or individual. And then I challenge all of you guys. So what I did today is try to Google what exactly is going on. You can't find it. You can't find anything from you guys. You can't find anything from Catholic health charities. It's just a bunch of rumors about all of it. Honestly, I don't even know what's true and what's not true. All I know is that we need clarity. Um, you know, I don't think anybody's opposed to having like one shelter. We understand we need to do our part as a neighborhood. Um, I just think that everybody kind of wants to know what's going to go down in our community. Um, we spend a lot of our savings on our house, you know, and if we, if we get goes down and we lose a ton of money, like we'll be really behind the eight ball. Um, so thank you guys so much for your time. This is my first time being a part in something like this and it's really cool. So thanks for listening. All right. Thanks for coming down and thanks for practicing medicine here. We appreciate it. Um, all right, Kim Schmidt. And then I just have Melanie, no last name and Crystal. And after that, Alexis. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello, Kim Schmidt Hi. from the Valley. Um, I wanted to bring something up because I missed this a while back. Um, this is a uh, letter of award dated February 1st, uh, 2021. Uh, this letter was written by Chief Meidel. Um, Captain Tracy Meidel had nominated Lieutenant Overhoff for the Medal of Merit Award. Uh, Chief Meidel decided that he was more, um, the Distinguished Service Medal was more up his alley. Um, the Distinguished Service Medal is awarded to employees who have demonstrated outstanding, sustained, and exemplary performance along with diligence and devotion to duty. So this is part of the memo, and I'll post this later. Um, over the past two years, Lieutenant Overhoff has led the TAC team on deployments to demonstrations and protests at Planned Parenthood, many occurring weekly. We know that's monthly. These events started out as inconsistent meetings organized by some community members and grew to be very large gatherings which garnered a great deal of media attention and additional protesters with varying opinions. I'm one of those varying opinion protesters, as you all know. Um, as these demonstrations continued to grow in numbers and in media attention, Lieutenant Overhoff continued to adjust the way the team conducted their operations. He works with other SPD personnel and city departments to facilitate investigations and reports of potential criminal activity in order to hold all participants accountable for their behavior. This is not an easy task, as each incident within each event is looked at under extreme scrutiny with hindsight. Lieutenant Overhoff continues to represent the Spokane Police Department in the best light possible. As you know, because many of you have actually been on email chains with all of us, uh, what Chief Meidel has described has not been the experience of many of us who have interacted with Lieutenant Overhoff at the mentioned events. Um, I personally started showing up to these events in June 2019 and attended every single month when we were showing up in person. Um, in fact, many of my experiences haven't been very pleasant. I recall a December night where my friends and I were countering TCAP. Overhoff approached to give us a noise warning. When we asked what ordinance he was going to be citing, he couldn't give an answer. Instead, what he continued to do was say, good night, good night, 
good night in a very dismissive manner. And then he continued on to say, my, my name is Lieutenant David Overhoff. You can find me on the internet. I'm all over the internet. That video many of you have seen. I'm, if not, I can get it to you. So, uh, basically, I only have three minutes and I know it's almost up right now, but I have a lot of examples, but I just wanted to bring that up because I just think that's important to know. The chief of police is giving accolades to somebody uh, stating in the memo situations which we know could be up for interpretation or false. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming down, Kim. Uh, next, again, I've got three names. They look like they're written by the same person, maybe signing people up. Melanie, Crystal, or Alexis? All right. Come on up. Hi. <laughs> I'm uh, once again standing here. And to go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, hi. I, my name's Melanie. I'm a community member. I've been out there in front of City Hall and down by the University District and all over the place giving water and food to those out in this heat wave. So <laughs> part of the cool Spokane. You can check out the hashtag if you'd like. We've been out here for all week making sure everyone's needs are met and we make it through this heat wave. So, yeah, I'm here again demanding compassion from an inherently violent system. You might think that you did nothing wrong, but that's just it. You and the mayor, Nadine, did nothing. That's why the public baked and boiled out there. That is a form of violence. Maybe you need to ask yourselves what really matters and if you'll be part of the solution or just continue to attempt <laughs> to attempt murder <laughs> via inaction and rules that will see people die, directly contributing to our neighbors' death, deaths. If those cooling tents down at Camp Hope are like forced to come down during these incredibly hot times, it is ridiculous that that would even be on the table to be thought about. This year, we are lucky, and with all our work and hard work to reach people out there, we didn't lose anybody in this heat. We weren't so lucky last year. And <laughs> so I'd like to give us a moment of silence to those lost in the heat wave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. And if Crystal and Alexis. Welcome, Crystal. You have up to three minutes. Hello. I am Crystal Yasko Somberget. I am a Spokane resident downtown at the moment, co founder at Mac Movement. Just prior to the heat wave, I stepped up with multiple other organizers, 24 organizations, and 80 volunteers so far to provide mutual aid. Collectively, we have passed out thousands of waters and gone through literally tons and tons of ice and raised additional monies on our own to cover every gap we possibly could. Let me tell you, I have three children, two jobs, and a nonprofit. Adding Cool Spokane to my plate was an unexpected necessity for community care and emergency aid. Due to our city leaders, along with Nadine Woodward, failing over 1,700 of my Spokane neighbors during this heat wave. Last year, there were 21 deaths from extreme heat. This year, we had zero. That's thanks to Cool Spokane, and I believe they deserve a little credit for that. We're already stretching funding, coordinators, and volunteers very thin. I'm hopeful, hopeful with this group you'll find a prime example moving forward to prepare for the next heat wave. If you aren't planning something other than outright neglect, fund us. Give Cool Spokane the credit and compensation they deserve for saving the lives of your constituents. Thank you. I would like the rest of my time also uh, dedicated to a moment of silence for those lost last year. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, Alexis? And after Alexis, it's uh, Christine Quinn, and then Susan Menchie. Hi, I'm Alexis Tenasket. I am a descendant of uh, Chief Joseph Tenasket. So I am also um, 
in relationship with this land. And it is traditional to this land that a community looks very differently than it does right now. Um, traditionally to this land, a community is a group of people who take care of each other and who make sure that everyone survives. Um, something that this, uh, the city's current plans is missing is direct experience. So a lot of people, including myself, I've been working with Cool Spokane. I put in just over 20 hours this week out on the streets. I actually passed out on Saturday um, because being out in the elements was just really tough on my body. Um, so I can't imagine how people are surviving out there for consecutive days and nights. Uh, luckily, I was at home with my husband and he helped me out. Um, so we're missing direct experience. People who have not had direct experience being homeless, being severely impoverished, or having someone they love go through that and actually being there with them and having empathy for them, you cannot come up with a plan that's going to work. You just don't understand that reality, and, and that's how this goes. The current uh, plan, or lack thereof, is still costing taxpayers with emergency medical response, police clock hours spent uh, throwing away, frankly, the belongings of our unhoused uh, members of the community, whether it's garbage or not, whether it's still usable or not, whether my friends and I just gave it to them in order to survive. We're handing out survival supplies. We also spend money on jail time, and we also spend money on public defenders. We spend money on hospital and ER treatments for uh, medical emergencies that people have from being exposed to the elements constantly. We spend money on parks, uh, staff, and cleanup repairs. I'm also concerned for the staff at libraries and parks. A lot of these people have mental health issues. Our staff at the library and parks are not equipped to deal with that problem. Um, it's also a, a public health emergency. We are spreading disease. When people don't have access to, to restrooms, they're gonna go wherever they can, and that spreads disease. That's scientific knowledge. I'm not sure why we're trying to move back in time and not understand that. It's really shameful. No one aspires to be unhoused or addicted. When you're talking to a little kid, nobody ever would dream of ending up there. But the reality is, a lot of us are one or two paychecks away from ending up there. So we really have to figure out something else because this is a black hole and it's affecting all of us. Thanks for coming down. Uh, next is Christine Quinn and then Susan Minching and then I'm not quite able to read it. I can't decide if it's Paula or Jacob Duffy from West Hills, if there's someone like that. Hi, my name is Christine Quinn and I live in West Hills. <laughs> um, my neighbors have said everything exceedingly well. Um, so I'm going to add something and that is when you come into Spokane, you typically are coming through that area and aesthetically having all the having shelters and having and we have difficulty with homeless population now and I have great sympathy and I would love to see a solution I don't think this is a solution um, we have walking down our streets you'll come upon needles um, especially as soon as it starts getting warm there's often trash needles um, we've had many auto break-ins, we've had our shed broken into, we've had locks with bolt cutters cut in our gates. Um, so it's currently troubling and I believe adding more to it. Um, and for whatever reason, that seems to be a popular corridor. Um, so, thank you. Thanks so much, Christine. And then Susan Menching, and then, is it Paula? All right, thanks, Paula. And then after Paula is Tanya. 
Hi, Susan. Thank you, Councilman. Hello, my name is Susan Menching. I'm a homeowner in West Hills. We can all agree that as a member of the community, we matter to you, correct? We also can agree that Ascenda, a sober living facility, has been very successful and workforce housing is desperately needed, as well as homeless shelter. Decisions that have been less than transparent has put us in a position of reaction versus interaction. Lack of transparency put us, put us at a level of distrust. History shows us the lack of structure, law, civil society rule enforcement has caused major disruption in the downtown corridor and East Central community, which has caused a lot of distress in the business community and surrounding neighborhoods. However, as members of West Hills, how are we to trust that you have our best interests in heart? Has a study of how this will affect our property values been done? Has there been a traffic study or an environmental impact study? A loss of tax revenue analysis? I'm sure there are other communities that have done this. What are their successes? What are their issues? Do we know what they are? As you've heard, the West Hills is in prime for revitalization investment. Workforce housing, retail, all producing tax revenue. We've discussed that much in depth earlier. Without transparency, we are left with a list of questions and little answers. Will there be curfews, background checks, job requirements? What about the safety of the members of the community? How will the police respond? Will there have services besides crime check? Not one of my favorite places to call. How will petty theft, vandalism, trash, drug use, and loitering be handled in our neighborhood? Two words come to my mind, accountability and, ac accountability and accountable. Similar in nature, but deeper meaning in both. No government can spend money without someone paying for it. They have to generate the tax dollars. If they don't pay it through taxes, somebody is still going to pay a tax. Inflation is a hidden tax, a silent tax. It affects people who don't understand money, disproportionately affecting the poor and financially uneducated. There is no free money. A civil a society and city need tax dollars, investment, property, and business taxes coming from investors and their citizens. We must be respectful of proper growth, proper management, so that we can take care of each other in a humane, respectful, and dignified way. Moving 200 plus houseless citizens into our neighborhood without thoroughly vetting without thoroughly vetted plan could damage this neighborhood for decades. I respectfully request that you think more about the members of the West Hill community and the impact of your actions on our houseless society. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. And then Paula, and then Tanya C, and then Hadley Morrow. Hello, I'm Paula Swan, thank you. Uh, I am a West Hills uh, resident and I uh, would live across the street from the proposed pallet house. Um, by its very nature, when you qualify housing with the term low barrier, um, that adjective indicates significant problems, probably not only for the residents of the uh, housing, but for the residents of the area. And we have seen in the news recently the impact that not even an international company like Starbucks, when they decided to implement effectively low barrier operations in certain of their stores, that they had to close them down for the safety of their employees. So I ask you, obviously this is a rhetorical question, this um, isn't a conversation, but I ask you, how would you feel and how would you react if somebody wanted to put low barrier housing on your street. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Then is Tanya C here? Hi, yeah. right, Tanya, come on up. After Tanya is Hadley, and then we're gonna take a short break. Yeah. My name is Tanya, and um, I, li I live out here in, in Chatteroy with a friend right now and where he's at too um my, my it, it, it's hard for people to talk on their phones inside their um, trailers 
and and someone needs to come out there, you know, and and um, work on their internet thing out there, you know, because if because we 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 feel like they 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 don't want us to talk inside or uh, in the trailers out there, you know, and and they, and and it's hard for us to talk in the in the ha our trailers, and they and we need they need to um hurry with the transportations out there too, you know, because there because there's some people out there that I know that need it too. All right, thanks, Tanya, yeah. for coming down. Hadley, Morrow. Good evening, Council. My name is Hadley Morrow. I'm a District 2 resident. I'm speaking here just as an individual community organizer, not with any of my roles in the community. Um, this week, I had the honor of volunteering with the Cool Spokane Pop-Up Movement. Um, I recognize the responsibility for activation of emergency weather shelters lies within the Mayor's Office and CHS Department. I'm sending these comments to her as well. Um, but I wanted to share with Council an update on our effort that after July 20th and 21st, when we both saw two days that reached over 95 degrees without any activation from City on an emergency cooling shelter. Uh, I heard from a new number of community partners and volunteers who were interested in starting an all-volunteer effort to meet the need for cooling shelters because there wasn't trust that the city was going to be able to meet that. To be clear, since 20 people died of heat-related deaths last year, um, it absolutely felt like an emergency issue. This was Thursday, and by Monday, July 25th uh, through today, we have organized at least five minimum daily pop-up cooling shelters or water stations across Spokane. We were all quite disappointed to see how slow and uncoordinated the city's response um, for cooling shelters was, especially the lack of information, and simply found that the plan to only use libraries and, and splash pads was not accessible for all and would leave a huge strain on current systems that are not fully equipped to resource to deal with the public health response. Our teams called street medicine on multiple occasions for people with signs of serious health-related health injury or illness, and also our stations invited many people with pets or other barriers that would have been to welcome, to, there other barriers that would have been to being welcomed into the library. I don't expect that city staff on their own are able to, or currently resourced to meet the level of need and trust that is really called to um, meet the diverse level of need in this times of crisis. And I don't actually mean that as a blame or shame statement in any way. I say that because I absolutely believe working in this community that no organization and especially government is unfair to expect that any organization can serve all needs for everybody. What it really takes is collaboration. And what I'm asking for here is an opportunity to model a little bit of what we learned this week and reach out a, you know, an opportunity for, Paul, for an olive branch when this and does happen again, because I'm Sure this isn't the first heat wave of the summer uh, or the last one. So over the course of the heat wave, as some of my peers said, we raised over $5,000. We moved over 6,000 pounds of ice, 7,000 water bottles, hundreds of sandwiches, hundreds of snacks. We set up two misting and water stations run by local businesses, operated at least five sites daily, and conducted mobile outreach daily to the north side for folks that were not in the downtown core and likely to be missed by many of these resources. Um, I'm sharing just a little bit to brag about how cool my friends are. <laughs> Um, but also to model that with collaboration, there's so much more that's possible. It took 25 organizations and 80 different individuals to pull off what we pulled off this week. And I absolutely understand that that is not a department that the city has staffed right now just to focus on cooling shelters. So what we, we know that none of us could have done this alone because it requires the partnerships of strengths that all of us had. It, I would be remiss to not note that the majority of our organizers were women and non-binary and two-spirited folks. The majority of them were folks who were people of color and who come from lived experience of having navigated systems of oppression, whether it be mental illness, homelessness, or many more. Um, and with that, it was really, I think, pivotal to our success and the ability to trust and the fact that people were able to find us and trusted coming to us asking for help. Um, I think that I see a solution here where we could definitely see the city partnering with uh, providers like Cool Spokane, and I'm here to ask for advocacy in a conversation moving forward to try to be, work proactively in a comprehensive plan towards uh, meeting the needs during emergency weather situations. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming down. Appreciate it. All right, we're gonna be in recess till 8.05 by the clock up there. Uh, when we call you back, please everyone finish talking and we'll finish up our evening. We have, about, we have about 15 people left.
Terry? Oh, I dropped him in the mail today. Yeah. All right, we're back in session. And you can uh, wind that up, please. Thank you. Um, so if the next person up is Becky Dicker Hoof, and then Ron Bear, and then Stu Lee. All right, welcome. Hello there. I'm Becky Dickerhoof from the city of Spokane. I was concerned today because I was watching the city council briefing, and a couple of things came up that struck me. There were two comments made from the city council. One was about the good neighbor agreement that you would like to have, and the other one was about the references to how the neighbors around Cam near Camp Hope are suffering because of Camp Hope. At one time, our legal system and our communities strive to consider our citizens innocent until proven guilty. It has become popular now to instead use innuendo to suggest crimes and wrongdoing based on hearsay or the demand to prove a negative. Unless you can prove it is wrong, it must be the truth. As evidenced by the recent unfounded comments against our Spokane County election system. We are also seeing that with Camp Hope, Many have accused the residents of crimes. The residents have asked those who are victims of those crimes to file police reports and provide security evidence so they can find those people if they are residents so they can be evicted and prosecuted. Instead, they have been told it will be covered by insurance. So instead of locating the residents or proving they are not residents, they carry the cloak of guilt. The good neighbor policy may well be a good policy, but only if all neighbors may participate in the policy. Camp Hope isn't perfect, but 600 plus people are not downtown. Some of those people have now found jobs. They are trying to turn their lives around. Eric Finch said in April, in an April public meeting, that the neighborhood around Camp Hope was not experiencing a significantly higher crime rate than any other neighborhood in Spokane. Some council members have visited Camp Hope and found college students who had to choose education over housing. Council members have discovered city employees and private business employees are living in their cars because they can't afford housing in Spokane. It is not helping our city to stoke the flames of prejudice towards those that are already suffering by painting them with one black brush. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron Bear, and after Ron was uh, Stu Lee, excuse me, Stu uh, Lee, and then Oliver Graham. Welcome. Good, uh, good evening. Uh, President Beggs, uh, council members, thanks for listening. Uh, my name is Ron Bear. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Spokane. Um, moved back to the Northwest with my wife in 1996, just in time for Ice Storm, where our house burned to the ground. We're on page 28 of the Spokesman Review thing. I'm in a yellow jacket. Don't recommend it. Our house was right above where we currently live, which is in the, North, is in the West Hills. We live on F Street, right near Whittier Park. It's a beautiful place, great people. I'm a public school teacher. My wife's a public school teacher. I went to Gonzaga, go Zags. My son went to Gonzaga. I believe in this community. I teach not because I can make a lot of money at it, but because I love what I do, and I give back to my community. I happen to teach at Libby Center, about the same distance from Camp Hope as where you're proposing to put four homeless shelters from my home. To suggest that Camp Hope has not raised crime in my neighborhood is nonsense. I walk out every day with 29 students and put them on the bus. I have had to shuttle them inside as security came to take the naked man running down the street away. I have personally picked up more hypodermic needles than I can count. I've stopped kindergartners in my school from picking up condoms, drug paraphernalia, etc. Camp Hope is not a, a great place with great people. They need help. We need to do something for them. I believe in that. I've, not, I've got a senda just down the hill from me. Good. If we need another homeless shelter near my home, I will help with that. But to put four of them within a one mile area is insanity. And it will lower property values. It will run away businesses. I have two neighbors that live near us that are selling their home because they know this is going to destroy our neighborhood. Please reconsider. Please 
spread it out. We live in a city with huge industrial areas that are unused. Empty shopcos, empty Costcos, big places with lots of roads, lots of infrastructure, close to services. Why, in goodness gracious sake, would we put four of them on a single little road going up and down a hill by the Finch Arboretum Fish Lake Trail and a whole bunch of family members with kids and adults and retirees? Please reconsider. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Stu Lee, after Stu is Oliver Graham, and then Lamar. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my neighbors, oh, Stu Lee, West Hills. Uh, my neighbors have talked of uh, young professionals and young families and school teachers and the elderly and thought, oh, wait, that's me, my turn. Um, I've lived in that area for about 30 years, just across the railroad tracks by the Rosemond Bridge there. <coughs> What's going to happen to my neighborhood is is unspeakable with with everything that's gone on. When the first shelter was introduced, Catholic Charities uh, at the bottom of the hill there, Sun said, "Okay, our turn. You know, we'll house. Yeah, it, we'll have to put up with it." Ascenda started out as not a good neighbor, but they have turned into a, a, a great neighbor. Um, was willing to deal with the one. Oh, wait a minute, there's another one. Oh, wait, quality in, are you kidding me? And then now, uh, oh, goodness, we're gonna be surrounded. Uh, it's, 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 an, it's nuts. To this specific issue of the quality in, the lack of transparency, everything that happened behind closed doors with no public input, with, with no town hall meetings. One of the earlier legislative agenda items, uh, Councilman Cathcart spoke of uh, putting money to good use to do good things for our city for years to come. Not the case at all. President Beggs, you spoke of, uh, on the same issue of, of uh, town hall meetings and community input, and we've researched this, and we've, we really are confident that this money is going to be well spent. Specifically with the quality in, there was zero, no communications with the neighbors, no public input at all. No comments made. No, it, it, it you know, it, it's I, I, it, insanity. The last gentleman said insanity. It is like you can't. You're just going to stick all this in our neighborhood, and my my property values are going to go down. I'm sure my taxes won't go down. Do I get a grant for a fence to put around my property to to keep ne'er do wells out? Because you're going to surround my house. I uh, the. Empire Health Foundation's property, I could hit it with a six iron out of my front yard and a driver in a four wood up the hill to the other one. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy. It's, I don't know, anyway, good neighbors. Catholic Charities, if you go downtown, I used to have an office at West 41 Main, a half a block from the original uh, House of Charity. Horrible neighbor. The new House of Charity. I have friends with an office a half a block from that one. They are a horrible neighbor. They're good people. They're nice people that want to do good things. They are not good neighbors. They don't have to deal with what goes on around. They come in, deal with the people, and then they go home. But anyway, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm devastated that, that what is a unique, wonderful neighborhood, Whittier neighborhood, is, is going to be thrown out by the, by the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. Uh, is Oliver Graham here? Not seeing Oliver. Um, how about Lamar? Yes, come on down, Lamar. After Lamar is Dave Bilsland, if you could make your way. And um, after Dave is Lisa Sandro. No, you're next, Dave, after Lamar attendees and leaders. Uh, I am Lamar, L-E-M-A-R. Um, I've come from one Bay Area and recently left the field of opportunities and here I am on the another coast. I would definitely begin with um, uh, we believe that most things that we do uh, is good for the good for humanity and Most things that we do is for the good for humanity. Uh, and after five or 
billion years of natural power or resources and another 30,000 average of the human lifespan. An additional 300 trillion cells have been disturbed within five seconds uh, just by individual Lamar? or just by a simple Lamar? second. Lamar? I am. I, we need you to address the council president. That's one of the things. So I need you to go back to the normal place. I don't think the mic's supposed to bend that way. So No? Yeah. So if well, you it's could, bending. I know, but if you could go back and address your comments to me. I failed to say that specifically, but if you could just speak to me. Oops. Dang it. Um, and with that one simple change, it was the best uh, suggest that the, the great change that would be sufficient enough would be would be uh, to change one simple idea of being cognizant of the emotional response of individuals as well as the sensitivity of different subjects. I'm not saying that anything that I have been experiencing is not a fantastic time of life, but uh, with the, uh, from women's abortion to ecological management all the way over to homelessness and as well as healthcare accessibility, uh, being able to have those things, I uh, would say to begin to uh, remove one vocabulary term from a conversation, communication is key. Communication is guaranteed. A one situation of our misconduct over many years in lifespan, yes, things do repeat itself. Um, I would just say to begin that, it would be self-exploration and self-study uh, to begin with the patience of dialogue. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. All right. Thank you, Lamar. Uh, next is Dave Bilsland, and then Lisa, I think, Sandro, am I getting that right? And then after Lisa is Kevin Holland. Good evening, folks. We have a problem, <clears throat> and that is our mayor. She wanted to kill people by taking down that cooling shelter. I consider that to be conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Because if that cooling shelter had been pulled down immediately, we would have had the same record we had last year, 20 people dead. But because of that cooling shelter, we have lost nobody. That cooling shelter made the difference, and she wanted to tear it down. I see that as a problem of character, and I'm about ready to organize a class action lawsuit to sue the city for not providing enough cooling centers for everybody. You know how many people I've talked to that look like hell because they're forced to be outside and they're not comfortable going to the library that she suggested. And they can't go anyplace else because they look like hell because they've been out in the sun too long. And thank goodness, for all these cooling shelters, all these cooling zones, the, the people handing out the water and all that. That has literally saved lives. Where's the city? Opening up libraries is all she can do? There is so much more can be done, and I'm serious about this class action lawsuit against the city. My city has not done its job. It's not your guys' fault. It's not the legislative branch's fault or the judicial. It's the executive branch that is falling down and is not ex executing all the appropriate ordinances, like opening up cooling shelters, like when we get smoke in this next month or two. How about some place for somebody like me with COP to go? So I've got COPD. We get that smoke in, it's hell on me. I can handle the heat, I can handle the cold, but I can't handle the smoke. Are there gonna be shelters where I can get some clean air? I think not. I don't expect it because there weren't any place to go except the damn library. We need more places for people to go. We need more things like Jules Helping Hands providing a major cooling thing. Where was the city? Where's the city's emergency services? Where's the county emergency services? Huh? Wasn't this a freaking emergency? Thanks for coming down, Dave. Lisa Sandro, and then Kevin Holland, and then J.E. McHugh. Hi there, my name's Lisa Chinova Sandbo. Um, just a quick background on me, I grew up in Spokane, born and raised here, lived out in the valley, 
left at 18, went to school in Seattle, left, lived there for 30 years and have moved back just before COVID, uh, right before we came back into this area because it's home. Fell in love with the West Hills neighborhood. It's a fantastic area. It's, it's diverse for Spokane. It's as diverse as you're going to get economically. Um, you've got starter homes. You've got homes for people from $200,000 range on up to a million dollars in these neighborhoods, which are being completely overlooked by this entire process. I feel like that sunset bridge there where the river is, just a real easy natural barrier to push this Camp Hope straight up Sunset Highway and turn it into Skid Row. It'll be out of sight and out of mind for a lot of people. The, it'll be real simple. Nobody will see it along the highway anymore. That's just kind of where it's going to go. I feel like this neighborhood has been very respectful to Catholic charities when they opened, when they came to us and wanted to open that low barrier, the, or not, sorry, not the low barrier, that's the issue. Um, open the um, mother, the women and children's shelter. I think that's fantastic. I was a big supporter of Mary's Place in Seattle. It's a fantastic um, charity. It's a, I think that's a great program. But to open this up to low barrier opens it up to literally sex offenders, pedophiles, rapists, murderers. You don't know what's coming and going. You put three or four of these into this neighborhood. I've heard rumors of a soup kitchen. I don't know if that's true or not. You are just going to have people drifting right on up Sunset Hill Skid Row and taking over Finch Arboretum. It will be an entire tent shelter. I've lived it once and I will see it again if you allow this to kind of go on. Um, I've also never seen a city step over so much money. The biggest complaint I see in Spokane is there's no housing. There's no housing. We need housing, da 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 da. You have people who have stepped up and bought this property and are desperately trying to build apartments, 500 plus apartments for people in Spokane who need housing. And it's going to go by. Uh, you're, you're choosing this over that. You're stepping over dollars to pick up needles, essentially, those tax dollars. And I also just want to say it's also your job, the city council, to keep our community safe. And I feel like that's not even happening. All we are looking at is what's going on with um, this homeless shelter, these low barrier shelters, which are not safe. And we deserve to be represented also in this. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Kevin, welcome. After Kevin is J.E. McHugh, and then we're gonna take Emily Peters by phone. Good evening, council. My name is Kevin Holland. I live in Spokane, and I, like many others here today, live in the West Hills neighborhood. Um, I've lived in the, the neighborhood for over 25 years. I've owned more than seven properties in the neighborhood. I've done everything I can over the last 25 years to try and bring the neighborhood up and help the neighborhood. I was city council or, or sorry, neighborhood council president for a number of years. And we've done spectacular things in West Hills. Um, you know, uh, all these families have come and talked to you about how wonderful the neighborhood is. And it truly is a jewel in Spokane. The other thing to consider is it's the last real gateway to Spokane. I mean, it literally resides on the original corridor to bring people into Spokane from the west side. Um, I would encourage the city to uh, consider the comments that are made today about uh, the number of shelters that are considered for the area. It's not that we all don't have uh, concerns and sympathy for the homeless issue that we're all struggling with, because we do, and we would love to do our part to help. But I would encourage the city to create a heat map of some sort that tries to spread around the uh, saturation level of where the homeless are housed if we're fortunate enough to be able to provide housing for those folks that need it. And in closing, I would just like to bring to your attention your mission statement, which says to deliver efficient and effective services that facilitate economic opportunity and enhance quality of life. And I think that's a fantastic mission statement. I would just bring your attention to the fact that it's very difficult and a balance that you have to think about uh, providing an enhancing quality of life and economic opportunity without sacrificing it or depleting it from others. And I think that's something that you should ask yourself when faced with these decisions is, is it economically enhanced for everybody? Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, J.E. McHugh, and after that, we're going to have Emily Peters by phone, and then Holly Birchenall. Uh, good evening. I'm Julia McHugh, and I uh, live in the neighborhood that is immediately west of the West Hills neighborhood. So I'm here tonight to address the domino effect of what is being proposed for uh, a cluster, essentially, of homeless or unsheltered um, housing. 
there's no question there's a dire need. Homelessness and unshelteredness is massive. When I was a very young teenager, I lived through that myself. Uh, it's not fun, but it does cause uh, a great deal of concern, not just to the West Hills, but I'm in Palisades, which is, we're basically sandwiched between the West Hills, we're in the county, and then here comes Airway Heights. So we're being squeezed from all directions. And I just want to remind you, so think of me as an IMBI. So I want to tell you what's in my neighborhood currently, what we have on the west side and going west to Airway Heights. We have a waste energy plant. We have eight routes, count them, through Palisades neighborhood to the waste to energy plant. We have nothing but garbage strewn roads all the way out and all the way back. We also have the Graham Road landfill. So just picture, this isn't just the bottom of Sunset Hill. The west is, has become, is becoming, essentially the solution to all the problems. And we are bearing the brunt. So we've got the Graham Road landfill. That's another haul route. That's another corridor of garbage. The, the loads are supposed to be covered. They often are, but they sometimes are not. So what we have is a semi-rural landscape already in use as a garbage corridor, as dumps, as overnight camping, as people who sit and nod off and they're behind the wheel of a car. We've got two casinos. When the second casino went in, we had exponential increase in crime. I've had six uninvited people come down my driveway in the last four years, very uninvited. We also have a medium security prison out west. We also need a jail expansion. Beware, we have Spokane Raceway Racetrack, which is rather noisy. You can hear it as clear as a bell five miles away. We have two airports, more noise, increased helicopter traffic. So it's not just what you're laying into or attempting to lay into one neighborhood. It's, it's rippling out in a vast way. We've had a human cause fire burn down a, uh, I don't know what they were shooting up, but they burned down a, an equipment barn. It came within 100 feet of my property. Julie. We no longer have uh, ungated driveways. There are no more unlocked mailboxes. We've got yeah. it. Don't Thanks. do this. And Thanks. have you Thanks checked the statistics, down. the you're, crime statistics Julie, you're way of past this your neighborhood? Time, so. Thanks for coming down. All right, Hallie Birchenall, if you're here. And after Hallie is uh, Sherry Barnett and then Randy McGlynn. Hi, my name is Hallie Birchenall. I reside in the city of Spokane and um, I'm also a, a, a co-founder of Compassion Addiction Treatment. <clears throat> Pardon me. Our team participated uh, in Cool Spokane, and I just wanted to um, bounce off of what Hadley shared. Um, I feel like Cool Spokane did an incredible job of showing how simple it really is to collaborate for a solution as a community and how to work together in large partnerships for a common goal without making it political. And um, I think that that is what we're lacking right now in regards to um, the needs of the people residing at Camp Hope is, um, is stepping back, dropping the politics, and simply collaborating. As I listen today to the people from, <clears throat> is it West Hills? From, from right, there's so many, from West Hills. Um, I was struck by their experience mirroring, mirroring what our experience as a nonprofit has went through in the recent processes surrounding the needs of Camp Hope and the right-of-way funding. And that's um, the complete lack of transparency from our city and um, a sense of feeling thrown under the bus, undervalued, underseen, um, kind of just rubbed away. And, and so I want you guys to know it's not just you. It's, it's across the board. 
um, is very frustrating for all of us. And I feel like if, if, if those of us that, that did Cool Spokane could sit down with those folks from West Hills and like we could all actually just have conversations that drop the political spin and, and talk, and I don't mean just West Hills, but all, all, all partners within this city, we really could come up with some amazing, beautiful solutions. So I just wanna throw it out, that out there. We can do this, and I don't know what council can do to help support that effort, um, but I just ask that if you can help, please do. Thank you. Thanks, Hallie. And Sherry, before you come up, I, for, I for mentioned we were having Emily Peters on the phone and then I forgot her for a moment. So Emily, if you're there, if you wanna hit star three. All right, Emily, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> Normally I come a bit more prepared, but I spent the day at Cool Spokane and just got home after driving some other volunteers home who have been working on this for the last eight consecutive days. And um, so far, as a result of this, we've seen zero heat-related re heat deaths when last year in the same time frame we saw 21. Um, this really proves that an approach like this, a multifaceted approach where we're doing mobile outreach, we're meeting people where they are, and we're providing essential things like food and water um, at various locations in the downtown corridor and at Camp Hope. That's what works, that's what saves lives. And I think that's like, the most important thing um, to focus on right now is that people are going to die if we don't do more. And the city emergency um, shelter ordinance has proven insufficient. It's been improved um, and it was changed last year, but we have submitted a uh, letter signed by the community from Cool Spokane uh, requesting that there are more changes made. We would like to see um, the mandatory uh, cooling center opening temperature uh, lowered to 85 degrees. At 85 degrees, asphalt can be up to 140 degrees. And that's, I mean, downtown is like all asphalt and concrete. It's it's very hot, it's very dangerous, it's dangerous for pets, that people can't go to the libraries with pets either. So we need to see more centers opening that are providing more resources than a library can. A library is great, that's helpful, but it's certainly not enough. And we need to see, it, see them open for longer hours. We need to see food and water available, and we need to see people who are trained in, at minimum, first aid at these places. We also want to see an increase in funding um, during emergency times like this, um, unprecedented weather conditions, which I guess by next year, it'll be precedented if we have a third heat wave in a row, but um, we want to see increased emergency funding for um, the Spokane Fire Department. We have seen a lot of medical issues that people um, have needed to call street medicine for, um, ambulances that the fire department has responded to, some the police have responded to, and the police are not equipped to be responding to medical emergencies. So we need to find a way to meet people's needs. All right. And I would like to... Thank the rest of my time to those 21 months. All right. Well, we're just, you're over time. So thank you so much for sharing, was, uh, sticking on the phone, <laughs> and for all you. that you've done for people. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Sherry Barnett. And after Sherry is Randy McGlynn. President Beggs and all members of the city council, I'm just going to make a little statement on this about the cooling, because I went to the library, and it was not very much used. Beautiful furniture and cool and restrooms and fountains and very little usage. Maybe they need bus tickets. I, I don't know. But um, same thing with the park. The fountains there, not very many people in the park taking advantage of that cooling. But 
the main thing that I wanted to talk about and um, why I came doing this all in the very beginning is because of the time that we're in right now, we're in the end of time. We're in the time where the Lord's forces and the enemy's forces are going to come into a great battle. And we're allowing lawlessness to grow in our country. Remember Tocqueville, when he studied to see the greatness of America, he found it in the churches and in the righteousness and in the, the love they had for their country and in their can-do attitudes. But he said, when America is no longer good, America will no longer be great. And we, nobody is owed everything. We all have to help. We all have to help with this homeless thing. And there is a lot going on. Some people are coming here that are not from here. I think we need to make a deep study, but we do need to help and keep people alive. But above all, you know, I want you to know that that's going to come. When they can say that a child, if you go to the hospital, medical library, you will find a whole library on just blood types. You'll find another library on everything to do with the eyes. The miracle of miracles beyond all comparison is that even we exist in this world. And I just want you to know to place your heart on Jesus Christ because that battle is here. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Cherry. And then Randy McGlenn's our last speaker. Council President. Council President, uh, after, yeah. after Randy, can I have a point of personal privilege? Sure. Thank you, Council President, Council Members. Uh, talking on behalf of the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board, first of all, as the chair of that board, I thank you very much for appointing three more members. We haven't been able to meet quorum for several months, and so I'm, I'm very excited to be able to start our work and, and, and get to the business of, of helping to repair uh, our residential streets and to complete sidewalks and make our roads safer. So thank you for that. Um, I would like to work with council members on how we can ensure that we don't have challenges in the future. We set our quorum numbers as low as we could so that we could try to make those quorums without sacrificing the integrity of the board's vote. But um, this was a concern initially when, when these changes were made and so I'm, I'm just not sh sure what mechanisms we will have in place to make sure that we have people filling those positions as needed. And, and they're very important positions. We're, we're really working hard on trying to increase that outreach and engagement within our communities. So uh, I would love to meet with uh, any of the council members that are part of the TBD to discuss that, if that's possible. So thank you. Uh, uh, Randy, yeah. don't go. I, we're not supposed to engage, but I just wanted to tell you that, and everybody, filling the boards and commissions has been very challenging. So they're all struggling to find folks. And I think probably we need to talk about that overall more, that please volunteer for our boards and commissions. Certainly. So, yeah, you're not, you're not alone. Thank you. And before you speak, Councilmember Cathcart, I just wanted to mention for the West Hills folks, um, City Council staff is working on organizing some type of event, hopefully Wednesday afternoon, and has invited the players who are involved, which is Catholic Charities and Empire Health Foundation and the Department of Commerce, and so those are the people working on that. The city's not really in charge of that, but we're trying to be facilitators and do that. So we're working on that. I don't know if the details are completely figured out, but we're looking at maybe four o'clock or so at Finch Arboretum. Uh, so we're working on that, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, yeah, well, so don't just sit. We heard about it last week. That was the request. We're working on it. So it wasn't planned before. So we're better to get it than, than not. But, so. but Council Member Cathcart. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, for the, the folks from West Hills, would love to connect with you um, and, and chat more about, about your experience and concerns. Um, certainly, I, I, I hear you. Uh, but I just, I really wanted to take a quick second and, and actually thank uh, uh, that organization, um, Spokane Cool, for 
the work and the effort that they did because I think what it does is it demonstrates you know, that uh, a group of passionate people can come together, they can work together, they can volunteer, and they can make a huge difference in our community. And while government certainly plays a role and, and can always play a role, um, you know, people coming together is going to be the, the biggest impact that we can possibly see. And so, <clears throat> and so I just, I really wanted to take a second. Uh, we heard so much about their efforts, you know, eight solid days of, of nonstop work trying to pull those together and get out there and distribute water and, and cooling centers. And so just thank you from the bottom of my heart, you know, thank you for that. And, and to the, the, the person who was talking about it not being political, exactly. And that's great. People coming together, getting out there, helping folks. I just, I'm grateful. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, we can put together a, a better, smarter plan as a city as well and how we address this going forward. Um, but, but in the meantime, having volunteers like that is incredible and it, it really does mean a lot to um, everybody. So I just wanted to say that. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming down. And those of you who stuck around for several hours, thanks to my city council members. Thanks to our staff who are here, TV5, our police officer here, Sergeant Yamada. Really um, appreciate it all. We are going to be off next week. We're not doing anything next week. And then we'll be back on August 15th. So please take care of yourself. And if you can, take care of someone else. We're adjourned.